As an actor, it's my job to present other people's words, emotions and behaviour patterns that very often bear little relation to my own. But in real life, there are no scripts, there's no rehearsal, it's just the one performance that has to last a lifetime. So, we behave naturally, we are ourselves and we do what we really want to do, don't we? Ah, <clears throat> let me show you what I mean. Well, that didn't work. Let's try again. Listen, I don't know who the hell you are, but you're being bloody inconsiderate making a rumpus at this time of night. Now, I'm warning you, if that noise doesn't stop right now, I'm going to call for the police. Oh, yeah? Just you try it, and I'll make sure you won't be able to wake up in the morning. Listen, Sonny, any more lip from you, and I will personally ram that submarine down your cake hole, Sammy! OK, boys, call it. Killjoy was here. Ah, uh, I didn't handle that situation very well. Or at any rate, the character I was playing didn't. But then, it leads me to wonder how successful I am in similar situations in real life. And real life is what this series of four programs is all about. How does the way we behave reflect what we really feel? How many times have we cursed ourselves, or at any rate I have, for failing to deal effectively with those stroppy shop assistants, or unreliable builders, over-persistent salesmen, difficult parents, or children, or just inefficient Spanish waiters who seem to counter every request with a que? I'm sure there are times we've all wanted to handle the situation better. Haven't you ever felt like that? There were certain situations that happened from time to time, and I thought, well, afterwards, I, oh Christ, you know, I handled that really badly. You know, I, I either came away sort of letting somebody get away with something that would, was quite absurd and which they shouldn't have got away with, and feeling cross and angry with myself that I'd let it happen. And the reason I'm here is to try and not be intimidated by not so much people that I know that are friends, but by new people. Um, if someone's aggressive to me, I'd rather go and hide under the carpet than yeah. face up to it. I'd just say, oh, fine, OK. But if I knew them, I would say how I feel. I find it very difficult, unless I'm in a comfortable situation, to do that. I find it difficult to um, naturally think about being aware of what I'm feeling and therefore saying what I'm feeling. I find it very difficult to put myself across to people in all situations and I get a lot of anger and frustration <clears throat> and depression from this and I'd like to be able to change that and uh, well just be a better person because of it. Ah uh, yes I recognize one or two things there that I can identify with unhelpful behavior patterns that could do with a little attention be assertive they say but what exactly does that mean? Well, it's like being like, if you're 
Well, like, if you're not a weed, and if you're like, you definitely know what you're talking about, or something like that. Assertiveness? No, I don't mind. Showing your authority, I think. Is that right? <laughs> I'm being assertive now. I'm going. <laughs> Opinions vary, and so do the dictionaries. The Shorter Oxford says it's being positive and claiming your rights, which is what lies at the heart of assertiveness training. It began in the United States 30 years ago. Anne Dixon, author of a book on the subject, has been teaching assertiveness in this country for 10 years. Assertive communication is being clear and honest and direct. But more than that, it stems from a feeling of equality, which is quite unusual in this particular world. Because instead of winning, instead of having to push somebody over, make somebody else lose out, it stems from a feeling of self-esteem. Well, yes, but I'm... Hilary Ratner is another assertiveness teacher. I think it's feeling good about yourself, liking yourself pretty well, and liking other people, and being able to communicate. I think it's about self-confidence, and it's about communication. Um, some people imagine it's about power and how to manipulate other people and how to get them to do what you want. And I don't think, th I think that's getting it by the wrong handle entirely. I think it's much more about communicating well, being open, being direct, being honest, and encouraging the people that you're relating to to be open and direct with you. And I think then you can actually get much closer and have a much better relationship. Being assertive is being appropriate. It's just that often people feel that the only choice they have is either being aggressive all passive and it's actually showing that there is a middle way and, that, and it's a very effective way of communicating because it is only then that the other person will listen. All over the country and in many places throughout the world people are coming together to learn this middle way. Young people in schools and evening classes, large companies and organizations, disabled people and the homeless. Through learning to change their behavior and become more assertive, they hope to cope better with difficult situations, difficult people, and difficult feelings. Assertiveness must be a matter of uh, unlearning bad habits. Yes, first you have to identify what gets in the way of clear communication. And usually that's anxiety. Mm. When you can do that, then you can learn to change. You can actually learn to manage anxiety, which is an enormous problem for a lot of us in different situations. That's fundamentally optimistic, which is why I'm very committed to assertiveness training, because people can learn to change very old habits, habits that they've had for a lifetime, not expressing feelings, yes. always being indirect. They can actually learn to change and see that, that they can be much more effective. We all become conditioned into behaving a certain way while we're very young, so it's useful to learn to change while we're young too. These South London schoolboys are learning assertiveness skills at an age when most boys are naturally aggressive. Oh, I said, oh, I said about one. five a day, my son. Yeah, and I suppose they're all kaput, in it? No, Rubbish. they're all perfect. About perfect. So how yeah, that one must be something to do with you. About so how can something do with me? Have I got electricity in me or something? I don't know, but I don't know. You do. Well, you're coming in, you're wasting our time. People all quite no, willing to no. spend decent sure, money sure. in here. I wouldn't have a walk with No, you. go I away. Sorry, no, you can't have it. So why? Because I'm telling you. Well, that was fairly aggressive, but how many of us wouldn't be tempted to behave like this with a stroppy shop assistant? Now, Dwayne tries it the assertive way. Excuse me, I bought um, this uh, Sonic Walkman last week and um, I found out that it's not working. Could what you do you mean it ain't working, you fool? Of course it's working, look, perfect music, look, perfect. Of course it works. No, you can't. Look, where's the box? I'll wrap it up for you and you can go home on your way. I know that it's not working. I tried it out last week. No, I'm like, very please, sorry. Please, no, please it works. It works perfectly. It does not work. No, sorry. I'm you no. It does not work. No, no, sorry. I've learnt to um, be more cooperative with teachers. Um, also, to get on well with other uh, pupils. I used to argue all the time. So, and if anyone made a remark, I'd argue with them. But now, I just let them say I disagree with them, like we've done in there, you know, I disagree with them. But before I was really, you know, arguing. It's not just schoolboys who have to curb their aggression. Some of their teachers have been known to behave in a similar way, and there are parents who probably do so too. Leslie is a teacher in East London and chose to do an assertiveness course because she felt she was too aggressive. People tend to make the assumption that um, you only need assertiveness if you're quiet. 
and passive. In actual fact, um, talking about the, the balance of behaviour, I think for me, I wanted to to learn how to control my extreme behaviour on the other on the other way. I was very aggressive in many situations, many times overconfident, um, downright cocky. <laughs> I recognise non-assertive behaviour in myself by just feeling uncomfortable as a result, whether I'm aggressive or whether I'm passive or whichever. It leaves me feeling the worse, and that's what I try to get rid of through training. Is that right? That's right. It also leaves the other person pretty uncomfortable. I mean, uh, often if if you're at the other end of someone who's being passive, you can feel very frustrated if they yes. won't make, make up their mind, if they won't take responsibility for what they want. And if you're at the end of an, an aggressive outburst, you're, you're usually feeling quite hurt and bruised and shattered, even if you don't say anything. So there are no winners, really. I mean, both sides That's right. lose out on it. John Cleese and psychiatrist Robin Skinner are fascinated by the way people behave and have even written a book about it. Well, I think it's a marvellous... Uh a marvellous subject for the English because I think we find it very difficult to be direct and it's something for example I think the Americans are better at and I had a marvellous example in California not very long ago when I was sitting at a table that was half English and half American and, and it, one of the English guys wanted someone to pass him the salt and he stood there and sort of went and when he caught somebody's eye he said sorry <laughs> and America would say Pass the salt, please. I think we have a great difficulty about being direct because we're so frightened of anger <clears throat> that we've got to the point when we wrap even our simplest requests up, let alone saying no. We say, I wonder if I could bother you to, uh, if you'd be so very good as to, you know, we do all this. So saying, please pass the salt. Waiter. Yes, sir. I don't want to be the nuisance. I hate to think I'm making a fuss, but. This is chicken and mushroom. Indeed it is, sir. Was that all, sir? Yes, just a minute. I'd hate you to think I'm complaining, but I think I did order steak and kidney. I beg your pardon. You said no such thing. If you'll pardon me, I think you'll find that I, I did. There we are, sir. Malplacket rooms, table 13, one pie. Plain as your nose. With the greatest respect, I, I think I said steak and kidney. Well, if you'd said, I would have written it down, wouldn't I, sir? Well, you probably said, I think I'll have the pie. Well, the pie could be anything, couldn't it, sir? The game pie, the fish pie, the chicken and mushroom. Oh, no, I wouldn't have ordered chicken and mushroom, I assure you. You see, I have an allergy. Well, I'm not a mind reader, am I, sir? If you'd said what you wanted... Yes, shall we just leave it, please? I, I'm sorry I said anything. In assertiveness training, people spend a great deal of time role-playing, which looks and sounds remarkably like acting to me. I'd like to have a, a private word with you. But people often do confuse it with acting and think they have to put on a performance, but if you do it, you're very aware of how it's not acting because you have to be yourself in the situation. It's a vehicle for practicing the skills, and one of the main difficulties that we have is that we get very anxious. We each have our own anxieties, and it may be when we're angry, it may be when we have to say no to somebody, it may be dealing with someone in authority. Mm. Whatever the situation, it makes us anxious. And that anxiety will either make us aggressive or it'll make us passive or manipulative. So what each person has to learn to do is manage that anxiety in the situation. Now, simply watching somebody else do it, it can be very insightful and helpful, but the only way you can learn to change your behavior is by managing that anxiety differently. And this is what the assertive skills are about. They actually help you manage the anxiety. It seems to me the marvelous thing about having a situation where you can practice being more assertive is that you do it and the ceiling doesn't fall in. And you realize that a lot of this fear that you've been carrying about acting in this way is, is totally imaginary. So, Anne, it's something for me. I come to your classes. What happens? How do I start? The first area we look at is how you actually ask for what you want, how to make requests, which sounds very simple until you look at the actual words you use and how you ask. Now, remember, we have often been used to being quite indirect about this, and it's easier to come in and say, my God, this is a mess, instead of saying, I'd like you to clear it up, or 
to sigh and look heavenwards, yes. hoping that somebody will notice you're tired and offer to do something you don't want to do. Yes. You know, yeah. or all sorts of ways, actually, instead of saying what it is we want. So the first skill involved is being specific, actually finding the words which express what you need. Waiter. Yes, sir. I ordered steak and kidney. This is chicken and mushroom. Would you take it away and change it, please? Steak and kidney. Chicken and mushroom. I, I thought you ordered this. Doesn't matter what you thought, it's wrong. Would you take it away and change it? Ah, there we are, sir. Table 13, one pie in black and white. It doesn't say it has to be a steak uh, and kidney. It doesn't matter what's written down, it's wrong. Is there something wrong with the chicken and mushrooms? Only that it's not what I ordered. Very well, sir. And you want the steak and kidney? You've got it. But it's just confronting, it's doing something about the situation. Mm. Yes. Okay. Should we yeah. try that? Yes, all right. Okay. So, so if you, you kind of walk along and then t when you're ready, turn yeah. around and say something. On her way to the workshop, Penny had been followed by a man. She'd been upset by this, but had failed to do anything about it. She and Susan role-play the situation with Anne's help. Can I help you? <laughs> <laughs> what Penny says there is a lovely example of what we do when we're anxious. We come out with the first thing in our, in our heads. And it's the conditioning to be polite, to be sweet, to be friendly on all occasions. And it's nothing at all to do with what she really wants to say to him. What she really needs to say, to be specific, is, I don't want you following me. I don't like it. And so that's what we have to learn in a role play, how to actually say that specifically. Now Penny tries it again. Right, the phrase is, the phrase is... Why are you following me? Yes, <laughs> that's still a question. I'd like you to ask a statement rather than a question. Yes, not why you follow me. I feel, I mean, if you, you know, I feel uncomfortable. I was just saying, I don't like you following me. You know, I'm going to start off with that. That's the assumption that he is. If, you want, if you're sure he's mm -hmm. one, say, I feel, I'm feeling uncomfortable. I don't want you to follow me. Look, you're making me feel uncomfortable. Would you please not follow me? Oh. All right. <laughs> <laughs> that's a lot better. <laughs> How did that feel? That felt good. <laughs> yes? Yeah. Uh, the role play, the man said, all right, and sort of gave in. But isn't it sometimes quite dangerous to challenge a person who's following you? It'd be better to just walk off quickly. Remember, we're not talking about walking down an alley in the middle of the night. We're talking about being in the park where there are other people around in the daylight. So in this particular situation, I think it's perfectly feasible for Penny to turn around and confront him. What happens most of the time is when a man is following a woman, the woman builds up her anxiety and finds herself increasingly powerless to do anything about it. If she turns round and says very clearly, I don't like you following me, stop it, then he's going to get the message. All right? If she turns round, as women often do, and give a fairly ambiguous message, then the man's also going to hold on to that. Yes. All right? You have to turn round and say, I don't like it, stop it. If you then turn round and the man says something abusive or starts following you, you are then in a much stronger position to turn around and do it again. But you actually have to get over that awful feeling of turning around to confront. But once you've done that, you feel in a much more powerful position. I see. So it applies to a park. It wouldn't necessarily apply to a dark alley at night. No, assertiveness is, about, is, is being appropriate. In your conservatory, gas won't go in. Being there makes you shiver and glow. We've got a heater that'll make you glow. When you want to get gas, get color. There is a fella by the name of Max who entertains friends from his pilo packs. But instant heat, he never lacks. When you want to get gas, get color. So if you've got a room that's full of frost, do not worry, all is not lost. We've got a solution at not much cost. When you want to get gas, get color. A can powered gas heater can go anywhere. And selected cabinet heaters with gas are now down in price. So when you want to get gas, get color. Xerius de Givenchy, for men. Three across. Right. Sounds like beetle. I better than I know it. Jingo. Lingo. Bingo. 
Hello. This is not normal, Pickle. Oh, Heinz Plowman's Pickle. Mmm. It was tangy. Chunky. Why don't we always have this? We do. You live next door, Mr. Johnson. Get into a real pickle. Taste Heinz Plowman's Pickle. A booklet's out that'll help you do Christmas shopping. They took some honey, and plenty of money, wrapped up in a five-pound note. We all looked up to the stars above, and sang to a small guitar, all lovely pussy. When George Orwell wrote The Observer, he called it the enemy of nonsense. Read it this Sunday. You'll find it still is. Technology with taste. Your gas showroom has brought the two together beautifully. The new Leisure 2040, designed with fan-assisted oven for controllable all-round heat to fit your lifestyle perfectly. And there's a 60-pound trade-in. The Canon Double Oven Deluxe has a host of new ideas. Adds variety to your cooking, and with a 60-pound trade-in, draws compliments all round. There's just one place to taste these and many other cookers, your British gas showroom, of course. Plumbers can be the bane of everyone's life, and Peter wishes he dealt differently with his plumber, whose work had been so shoddy that soon after he left, the cellar flooded. When the plumber returned, Peter wanted to say how he felt. Oh, yes, oh, look, look, I'm terribly sorry, but, you know, there is an awful mess here, you know, and, and, and I'm afraid it's absolutely no good, you know, and, and we've got our, we've got well, our own plumber to, to come and do it, and, uh, no, it, it's no good, I, I mean, really, thank you very much. Okay. <laughs> well, that, that, that was it. That was it. Yeah. Well, you kind was... of pushed him out the door. Did well, you? virtually. I mean, I sort of, you know, and uh, you know, and, and I. Yes. That's yes. right. Yeah. What you can see very clearly in Peter's role play is the various ways in how he could ask the plumber, or how he could actually express his feelings. And the first time, he. It's very low key. He waffles, he talks all around mm. everything, and he doesn't actually get the feelings out at all. He just, he's dithering. Look at the mess. What? There's water everywhere. There's water all over the floor. The cellar's full of water. Have you I, don't know what you, I don't know what you think you're doing. It's n and I don't want you to put it right. I've got my own plumber, thank oh. you very much, okay. to put it I'm right. I'm sorry, I've got No, you. well, I don't, I don't, please, I don't want to see you again. Thank you. Goodbye. Okay. Right. Well, I feel better. I'm I sure you <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, um... The second time, it's the complete reverse. He goes right into the aggressive behaviour, yeah. right, right over the top. The plumber doesn't get a word in edgeways. Yeah. And the final time, he was able to say he felt angry and to say what a mess it was, and it came over very strongly. Right? It didn't come over as aggressively, but it came very strongly and very clear. Oh, look, come in. There's a terrible mess here. Look, all this room's flooded and there's water in the basement. I really am terribly angry and upset. It, it, it's such a mess. It's unbelievable. Yeah, I can understand why you're so angry. Um, it's my fault. I can I repair it now? Well, no, I, I'd rather you didn't, frankly. We've, in fact, we'd, I've called in our regular plumber and he's, he's, as you can see, he's here now doing it. So I think I'd rather leave it, if you don't mind, this time. Okay. Thank you. Okay. I can see that it was of benefit to him, that, that uh, role play. But in a real life situation, I have a feeling that uh, the plumber would not give him such an easy ride, would not admit uh, the blame so easily, particularly if the blame was indeed his. Yeah, but the difficulty is that while you are learning to be assertive, well, before you learn to be assertive, you, we always think that the success of any interaction depends on the other person, all right? That if they're too aggressive, then we're not going to be able to manage. If mm. they're too indirect, we're not going to be able to manage. What you learn through being assertive is that you have an awful lot of power within your own hands in the way that you communicate. One of the important things, as I see, is, is 
coming out of the confrontation, feeling okay with yourself. And, um, you know, and I can come out of the thing thinking, well, I was reasonable. <laughs> I didn't lose my cool. I didn't, or, and I didn't succumb to this aggressive bastard. And, but he, you know, he is an aggressive bastard, and that's, that, that, you know, there's a limit to what I can do. But at least I come away feeling okay with myself. And I think that that's, you know, I mean, that's, that's a hell of a lot to get out of something worth having. So we can come out of situations feeling better about ourselves. But what about the really awe-inspiring figures of authority, the experts who hang on to their mystique by keeping us poor underlings ignorant? Some doctors are thought to come into this category. That can be a problem, especially for, and here I cannot claim any first-hand experience, for pregnant women. <laughs> Hilary Ratner is teaching assertiveness skills to a group of pregnant women who want to have a say in how their babies are born. Because it's all very well knowing the theory about why you don't want them to do certain things to you. But it's being able to put it into practice. You may know that you don't want an episiotomy and there isn't a particularly good reason for it. But if the midwife is very overpowering, um, you need the assertiveness to, to be able to say no. You, know, you can know in your own heart why you don't want something, but being actually, being, actually being able to say it is something else. The reason I wanted to learn to be assertive was it's my second child and I, I realised that the birth and it is, is probably the most wonderful thing that happens to you. And if you plan for it and get it how you want it, it can be fantastic. Um, and if you don't, you, you can regret that for the rest of your life. So I think that's a good reason to learn to be assertive. Because if they approach you by saying that this will be good for the baby and that. You, you might not feel you have the confidence to contradict what they're mm. saying because medically they do know so much mm. more than you do. Um, mm. But yes, I think it, it will help, yeah. I don't think it's easy at all to be assertive when you're in labour. It's difficult. You need to coach yourself and to, be pra to, to practice, to be coached a bit, to have somebody there for backup. I think that's one of the many very good reasons to have a husband or a partner with you in labor. It's not at all easy. If you're thinking about body language, an assertive stance is usually meant to be standing tall and having your shoulders back and making eye contact, all of which is very difficult if you're actually flat on your back with your legs in the air and no knickers on. It's extremely hard to be assertive in that kind of posture. And I always tell people where you have a choice, like at an antenatal visit, ask to be allowed to sit up and put your clothes on and then discuss what's going to be happening in the, in, the, um, in the future. Now the class prepares for a role play. It takes a bit of relearning, I think, to realize that you're an equal human being and you have the right to be treated with respect, whether or not you have the same qualifications in, in their field. Erica doesn't want to be cut to have an episiotomy when her baby is born. But knowing that the doctor or midwife may not agree with her, she wants to practice telling them how she feels about this. We might need to do a little cut to just widen the birth canal so oh. the baby can come out. Right, I, I have it put in my notes that we didn't want any cuts. Well, we won't do it if it isn't necessary, of course. Uh, well, I'd like to try and push the baby out, and if I tear, then I tear. Oh, but it's, you see, a, t a, tear, a tear is actually much more, much more worrying than um, a straight cut because, you see, it's harder to stitch and the doctor can stitch up the episiotomy much more easily. So it's better if we cut you than if you tear. Well, from my point of view, it's better if I tear, so perhaps I could do Oh, but a tear way. can be serious, you know. It, could, it can be really damage you. Right. I've, I know what you're saying. I Probably the most useful assertive skills would be um, yeah. learning how to stick to your point and how to maybe repeat the same thing over and over again without losing your cool, without getting angry, without getting upset. Um, but just coming back to the main point, not letting anybody distract you and get you off the subject. Well, um, perhaps I could say now, because I might not be in a position then, to say that I don't want to be cut. At but all? At all. Even if you tear? Even if I tear. Well, you know, I mean, we, even if we advise you, I mean, that, that would be your responsibility then, well, if you had a tear. I know that you're very concerned for my well-being, and mm -hmm. I appreciate that. That is good, because actually, if you do acknowledge that the other person isn't just trying to be bloody-minded, that most of the time that's it right, is concerned, that's, that's right, you yeah. often find that that'll, that'll change her mm. attitude, and she'll actually be more considerate mm. of what you have in mind. It's good. I think that, that's actually a good thing to say. As as but as long as mother and baby are well, does it really matter whether you're assertive in labour? I think it makes a very big difference, because 
if she's felt that everything's been taken away from her in the labor, that everything's gone according to somebody else's idea of what should be happening, and she hasn't been involved, and she hasn't been informed, and it was almost nothing to do with her, it can affect how she feels afterwards and how she relates to the baby as well. I've known mothers who have really quite severe postnatal depression that goes right back to having had an awful labor. And the awful labor means being taken over, being out of control, having things happen that she didn't want and that she didn't even really understand or, or you know, have any voice in. Um, and that can mean that she doesn't really bond with the baby, that she finds it very hard to relate to the baby. Some people feel that being assertive is being selfish. Well, people often say it's selfish to be assertive, but I think that there's a healthy side to being selfish. It means looking after yourself well. And when you're pregnant, you're looking after your baby well, too. Um, I don't think anybody's more concerned about the baby's welfare than, than the, the pregnant mother. So, of course, she's going to stay flexible and stay open-minded, which is part of being assertive, and listen to what's said to her. And if she needs to change her mind about what she's going to do or not going to do or what's going to have be done to her, then she'll change her mind because she's not going to be rigid and inflexible. Of course, her baby's welfare is always going to be the most important thing. Love and sex come before babies in most of the thousands of letters that the son's agony aunt Deirdre Saunders receives. She recommends AT to her readers and has in fact done a course herself, which might surprise some people. I think people sometimes think that someone like me who's got a fairly obvious career is bound to be confident. And it's not true at all. You can have all sorts of bits of unsureness that are hidden away inside you. And I thought it'd be a good idea for me to do a course in assertiveness because I realised I often have difficulties at work talking about the way I, th I really want things to happen. Or, for instance, particularly talking about money. I think a lot of women find money a very difficult subject to talk about. We find it difficult to value our own work. And I realised that when I had to make negotiations to do with money, I often either sounded a bit aggressive because I was actually rather frightened inside, or else I sounded a bit manipulative and unsure and gave the other person I was talking to a rather unsure feeling. They weren't quite sure what I wanted. At work, a difficult area for women is sexist attitudes. Morning. Morning. Happy New Year, Derek. And a sexy New Year to you, Sandra. Ta da Who's this? Oh, it's New Year. Miss January. Flamey neck. What's wrong with it? Well, it's disgusting. That's what's wrong with it. Oh, I get it. Makes you feel jealous, does she, eh? Like hell she does. Honestly, you men are all the same. Sex-crazed, insensitive, male chauvinist pigs. Oh, well, it's too bad for you more of us work here than you girls, isn't it? You can't expect the rest of the world to fall into line with your personal hang-ups. It's not about bullying the other person. It's not about pushing them into doing what you want. It's about expressing your own needs and expressing them simply and clearly in a way that the other person can understand and just asking for what you want. It doesn't guarantee that you're going to get it, but it does guarantee better communication between the two of you. And I think communication is something that these days we're learning is very important. What's that? Well, it's New Year. Well, I know, but we're not going to have to look at nude women for the rest of the year, are we? Sure. Come on, Derek, take it down. I feel embarrassed having to ask you, but not half as uncomfortable as I'm going to feel looking at that all year long. But we all want it up. And all doesn't include me. I'm sure the other girls would agree, so please take it down. Well, I never knew you was a prude, Sandra. All right, I am, if that's what you'd like to think. But I find it offensive. So please, will you take that calendar down? All right. All right, if that's how you feel. I didn't realise. Thanks. Kitten in a basket it is, then. But I don't know what the cat's going to say. But can assertiveness training really change your life? It's a beginning in helping you know that there is another way of communicating, that there is another way of handling situations, even though you may choose to handle them in the way that you always have done, the more familiar way. Yes. But it, it gives you, it's like a switch, as I see it, it's a little switch that turns on and says, I am valuable, I am as important as the next person. And that's one of the fundamental things about assertiveness, is, is equality. That you have the right to be treated with respect, regardless of what age you are, what colour you are, what class you are, whatever. And that's very important to hold on to in a world which 
in which there are enormous inequalities. I think some people feel a limitation of assertiveness is that it's just a, a sort of script that you learn your way through this and the real life examples you come across are never the same and your husband or your wife just won't behave like they're supposed to in the book. I think the answer sometimes is that you haven't actually learned how to field the responses very well and you are allowing yourself to be hooked in to the red herrings they're throwing out and you're not coming back to what you want. It can be also that maybe you're trying to solve too much all at once. You're actually trying to solve your entire marriage in one conversation. And actually maybe all you should hope to get out of this one conversation is that he makes you a cup of tea in the morning. I mean, maybe that's all you're going to get this time, but that in itself would be a great relief. So in other words, you're not being specific enough. But I think also sometimes you need to remind yourself that you have the right to walk away. This may be the wrong time, the wrong place, you've got it wrong, and the best thing is to say, I've clearly chosen the wrong time, I'm going to leave it for now, and go away and rethink. It does take time. There's no sudden overnight change, you know? I mean, mm. people sometimes think if they do an assertiveness course right, then they can tick it all off. But, it, but I've been, I, I first encountered it 12 years ago, mm. and, and for me it's very much an ongoing part of my life. There are always situations in which I'm unassertive. But the great thing about it is that once you learn how to do it, you then have a choice. You don't have to think, the only way I can do it is by being passive. The only way I can do it is by winning. You can actually feel you can choose how to behave in a situation, which is a very empowering thing. After a couple of weeks, members of the group discuss how they've put their newly acquired skills into practice. And surprisingly, there are some very practical results for Leslie. I negotiated alone with my bank manager. Um, and I'm, I'm a financial incompetent anyway, I'm, I'm known as a financial incompetent, but I decided I would sort this out, so I sorted out, I, I, looked, I looked up all the bank rates and APRs and the percentages and everything, and I went, I made the appointment and I walked in and this bloke sat down and said, Dead. what kind of you saying? And I said, I'd like to borrow some money, but I don't like your bank rates, um, because if I went to such and such, it would be cheaper, but I don't want to go there, I want to go here, because you're my bank, so what are you going to do? And he said, do you want to negotiate? I said, yes, please. And we went all through it, and he negotiated a new rate, and I didn't understand part of it, so I asked him to explain it to me, because I didn't understand. And we got it down to far less than the, sort of the, the official one. And at the end, he said, what are you going to do with this money? And I said, well, I'm buying a TV, a stereo, and some music. And he said, hmm. He said, are you going to negotiate with a shop when you go and buy them all from the same place? <laughs> it was great. And I walked out feeling, oh, I mean, I know that if I'd been more knowledgeable, maybe I could have done it differently. I know that I... I got very waffly at times. I, I should have, you know. It was the first time I've ever done anything about it at all. Okay. And it, it carried on to today, because I went to Greenwich and bought two earthenware pots and said, what, are you going to do me a deal because I bought two of them here? And he took a pound <laughs> off. So it's, you know, everything's negotiable. <laughs> it was really good. It's the first time I've ever done anything like that, and I felt great. And, uh, yeah, I shall carry on. Well, you know, it was good. So to recap, if you want to be assertive, be specific. Know what you want and then say it. Make your point clearly and firmly, repeating it if necessary. And if you find that difficult or find it awkward to ask for what you want, then say so. Having done all that, change the subject or move away. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> Yeah? Hello. Look, um, I, I, I know you've only just moved in, so I, I find this a bit awkward to say, but I have to get up for work in the morning, and I want you to stop the music now. After all, it is uh, 2 a.m. Is it? <laughs> well, nobody's complaining, eh? Well, actually, I'm complaining. Look, I understand that you can get carried away with the music, but I would like you to stop it now. I think that's fair enough, don't you? Sure, sure. No hassle, man. Uh, okay, boys. Call it a day, yeah? Thank you very much. I mean, thank you very much. See? In the next programme, we'll be looking at ways of saying no assertively. I mean, no. Definitely, absolutely, no. If, if that's all right with you. There are no winners, there are no
better way How do you see yourself Learning to be yourself Better assert yourself Sorry to have kept you so late, Nicola. We're almost on top of it now, so I should call it a day. I can stop a bit longer and finish off. I, I'm not doing anything tonight. And why don't you let me take you out for a nice, quiet dinner somewhere? Dad? Hmm? There's this car for sale. Really? I've already got one. <laughs> I know, but I haven't. Well, I should get it. You've got your own money. Well, nearly, but I'm still 250 pounds short. You couldn't see your way clear to lending me the difference, could you? Steve's in Birmingham that week. The twins are at camp. So if you're taking Katrina to the seaside, guess what? Lucky old me can put my feet up. There's a rare treat. You're a pal, Joan. Bye. Hello. Maggie, darling. Mother. Look, I'm coming down for a fellowship reunion in your neck of the woods on Monday. So I thought I'd come for the weekend with you. Is that all right? <laughs> <laughs> and since then, she hasn't been able to look at a banana without coughing. <laughs> Oh, One for the road, right? Uh, um, yeah, of course. Oh, uh, <laughs> Ellie! I... I... I Oh, dear. How often have you found yourself in a situation where you're unable to say no? It's such a little word, and yet, if we don't say no when we really ought to, the consequences can be awful. I mean, take this example. With just a few more drinks inside me, I could easily find myself in an accident, breathalyzed, disqualified from driving, or even, heaven forbid, attending my own funeral. So. In this series of programmes, we're looking at ways of changing our behaviour so that we can say no and also deal with a number of other difficult situations. It's all about being assertive. That is, being clear about what we want and communicating that to others. I'd got into a situation I wasn't happy with. I didn't know why I was unhappy with it. And uh, I think that's why I behaved in many situations. Not only in terms of family, but also in terms of work in terms of personal relationships, with, with anger, shall we say, with this energy, this burn of aggression. I think perhaps in, in, in the family I, I, I was aware that I would sometimes leave things too long. I mean, little things in, you know, that the children might be doing that's irritating, but leave it rather long. Um, before doing anything about it, and then going over the top, you know, and shouting, and, uh, and you know, the usual sort of uh, domestic drama. I was finding it very hard to say how I felt to people. I was getting terribly hurt because I couldn't articulate how I felt, and getting terribly frustrated about it. I wanted desperately to have approval from everyone, which is a total impossibility, but when you're feeling low, any kind of comfort is better than nothing at all. Um, I'm a teacher. I would find it very helpful, um, some of these assertiveness techniques within the classroom. I have this image of an ideal teacher that has a sort of aura about them. They go into a class of rowdy pupils and there's instant silence, instant attentiveness, which is not something I've experienced. And I often feel that my behaviour is inappropriate and on the few occasions that I've actually felt good about asserting myself, I've really liked it and I'd really like to get in touch with that more and more and actually build on my own self-esteem. So, both men and women choose to do assertiveness training for many different reasons. Yet far more women seem to be attracted to it. If you'd been a woman for six centuries, you need all the help in the world uh, in how to be assertive. I mean, we've lived an incredibly passive role, living in the shadow of men. I mean, the only real time that we've come out of the closet in terms of being mistress of our own time and our identity is, is in the last few years. I suppose assertiveness training is attractive to women um, because they have gone through this long process of conditioning to always say yes 
particularly to men. Well, men are something expected to do it. I mean, I mean from childhood, they're supposed to look after their brothers and then look after their husbands. I mean, for women, I mean, almost part of being is subordinating your interest to someone else. Translate that into a working situation, it can be an absolute disaster. I mean, it makes a permanent block on your career if you're always going to be stepping aside for somebody else. And I think it's wrong anyhow. I don't think that, I mean, that there's something inherently better about men that makes them a better judge of whether to take a decision A or decision B. It might very well be that women are a better judge than that because they often are less emotionally committed or feel too much of their personalities on the line or on a particular decision. So I can see very well, I mean, women need to actually learn to say no to men an awful lot more. So it's usually men that ask for something, it's usually women that give it. Lovely to look at, delightful to know, is how many girls are still brought up. Maybe by the time these girls are adults, attitudes will have changed. But right now, some women still feel dependent on male approval. If attitudes are to change, women will have to learn to assert themselves. We feel sometimes that we have to be superwomen, which means being ever caring, ever compassionate, ever observant, ever attentive to other people's needs. It's putting, always putting other people's needs before our own, which is fine some of the time, but not all the time. We tend not to see when we have to set limits on time and attention and energy and end up being very overstretched and get very tired and very cross about it. That's the other thing. The resentment also builds up. I mean, compassion is a very lovely quality, but it becomes a trap. We call it a compassion trap. When you end up punishing yourself or doing yourself down because you feel you can't say anything to the other person because you feel too sorry for them, or they're too old to be told no, or they're too young to be told no, or they've got too many problems. Well, generally, when boys, you know, let's say they want to take me out or ask me off, buy me a drink or something. I just find it hard to say no because I feel sorry for them, really. If it's where um, a bloke or someone's trying to persuade you to do something, that's, it's really difficult for me to really, you know, say no. For instance, if your boyfriend you know, asking you to go somewhere, you really don't want to go, and you know, it's you know, difficult to say no you know, in case he leaves you or something. But I'm afraid to say no because it is actually admitting that you don't like the person or giving them the idea that you don't like them, you don't want them around. And I find that very hard, especially with family. But it's not just women who have difficulty with saying no. No, I still find it difficult to say no, uh, but much easier than I, than I used to. Uh, I think there was a period when I just did anything that anybody asked me to do, rather than, than put up with the displeasure that they would show because I was refusing them a request. And tell me, why is it often so difficult to say no? Because when we want to say no, it puts us in a conflict. Right, somewhere deep down, we, we know that no is the answer. But on the other hand, we don't want to appear selfish or mean or petty. It's very, very difficult. We've, we've learned that saying no is a very uncaring thing to do. And so it's the conflict which makes it actually difficult to come out with the word. And we try and find any other way of doing it other than being direct. But it's difficult because we don't like to appear mean. We don't want to be rude. We don't want to be... Uh, we don't want to rock the boat, yeah. in other words. We'd just rather go along with the whole thing and keep everybody supposedly happy. Yes, well, is it important to rock the boat, to say no? Well, I'm talking about when you want to say no. Obviously, if deep down you're doing something that you want to do, then that's fine. I'm talking about the situations where in your heart you know you would like to say no. And how do you cope with those situations? The fear is always that if I say no, I'm going to lose the friendship, the relationship. They're going to dislike me because I'm rejecting them. One, you want the other person to think that you're a nice chap. That's important. But the other is, I think there's another fear in there somewhere that they're going <coughs> to get angry or cause a scene, or maybe it's that you're going to hurt them by saying no. And one of my terrible problems for years was having far more to do than I wanted to do because I literally couldn't say no. I would pick up the phone 
knowing what I was going to be asked and wanting to say no and finish up saying yes, putting the phone down and being furious at myself. Short term, if you say yes when you want to say no, you get a temporary relief of the yes. anxiety. You deal with it temporarily, but you often find a way of finding, of saying no afterwards, saying it indirectly. But you get a lot of build-up of resentment in the situation, particularly if it's in a relationship or friendship. If you're actually doing something for somebody over a long time that you don't really want to do, or if it's at work where you feel you're doing extra things, things that you don't really feel a part of your job, yes. and you don't say no, you build up an awful lot of resentment. Here are some really effective ways of saying no ineffectively. Try some of them. You too can lose friends and influence no one. Why don't you let me take you out for a quiet dinner somewhere? Oh, Mr. Minard. Uh, Richard. How about today? Oh, uh, perhaps not tonight. But sometime, maybe? Possibly. Not out of the question, then? We'll see. Couldn't see your way clear to lending me the difference, could you? £250 is a lot of money, David. Well, it's not as if you haven't got it. That's not the point. The point is, I've always brought you up to stand on your own two feet. As much as I'd like to help, with the best will in the world, as they say, neither a borrower nor a lender be. Now, David, where are you going? Tight-fisted old wimp. David, just a minute, please. So I thought I could come for the weekend with you. Is that all right? Oh, Mother, you don't want to stay with this noisy family. Why don't you stay with your friend Gladys? You're always saying it's so comfortable. Because she's not my own daughter. Oh, I I've only just realised I'm away myself that weekend. We all are. So you won't mind if I stay in the house then, will you? One for the road then, Roy. No, I said that was the last one. Come on, I'm having one. Are okay. you deaf or something? I said no, N-O, negative, nor, nine, yet. Don't you understand English? Well, you know you're going to get tongue pie when you get home. You might as well give us something to complain about. <laughs> a man needs a drink, two pints, Harry. Listen, just because you're for the high jump when you get home doesn't mean to say I'm going to get the... Are you implying that I am under the thumb? Well, it's true. I see. All right, well... The next time you're in here on your Todd, don't ask me to buy you a drink. All right, I won't. Well, part of the skill is in recognising what it is you want. If, if, if it's a question that comes and you want to say 100% yes, then you jump at the opportunity. If it's 100% no, you say no. But it's in between, and most things that come are in between, the sort of middle area, and we don't know. Yes, I can see that to sort out what you really want to do does require some training. So how do you... How do you teach saying no assertively? The first thing is to be aware of that hesitation. If you really want to say no, then that hesitation is there and it's being able to say, for example, I'm not sure, I'd like to think about it for three minutes or three weeks, whatever is appropriate. Not to be forced into a decision there Never. and Never. That was very important for me to learn. I always yes. used to think I had to make up my mind immediately. And often there's pressure, we haven't got time, you've got to do it. But actually saying, I'm not sure. I want the time to think, is a, is a very good first step. Yes. The second is to be able to use the word no. Changing the way we behave isn't easy. Old habits die hard. So when people come together on an assertiveness training course, they practice the new skills they've been taught through role playing. Now, this isn't acting, I've learned that. It's being yourself, practicing behaving differently in a situation you've already experienced outside class and didn't feel too happy about. Joan is always being asked to look after her friend's little boy. She wants to be able to say no, sometimes. Joan, it's so nice to see you. What are you doing with the boys next week? Well, um, I'm home with the boys next week. Oh, you're home with the boys. Would you mind if T joined them? If I, could I send T down to join them? Um, <laughs> I'd say yes. <laughs> You look as if you're about to say. <laughs> Big smile. Joanna's lodger asked if he could borrow her power drill, and she explains she's reluctant because he has a reputation for never returning things. But her reluctance also made her feel uncomfortable. And I also thought, well, um, give him the benefit of the doubt. He might be changing. Everybody says he's such a bad guy. But you felt compassionate? Yes. Yes, that's exactly it. So I said, 
okay, but only for a couple of days and bring it back. And I never saw my power drill again. I'm just going out to Mark for a few days. Can I borrow your power drill? Um, hang on a moment, Gavin. I need my power drill and I'm not willing to let you take it. Well, it's only for a few days, no big deal. I mean, just put some chills up for me. Well, it won't take you long. No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's no big deal. It's just a power drill. I'm just putting up some shelves for my brother. I'll be, you know, you're not using it now. You're busy Gary, here. I know your reputation. I don't trust you, and I don't want what to. What reputation? <laughs> oh, poor Google. <laughs> Joanna found it very difficult to actually come out with the word no. To actually look at her lodger and confront him and say no. That's why she took a lot of time because it's a, it feels a very direct and a very blunt thing to do. And also, what she was having difficulty with was her feeling of being petty or being mean about saying no. She didn't actually need it at the time. So she's going against her better judgment. She's been told he might walk off with it. But she feels sorry and she wants to say yes in some way, but she also wants to say no. But she actually manages to say no quite clearly. She does it aggressively at first, but then she manages to say how she feels about saying no as well, and that makes it easier for her. I'm going to Mark's to put up some shelves. I'm just borrowing the power drill, OK? Gavin? Uh, I feel uncomfortable telling you this, but I am not going to lend you the power drill. Why not? It's only for a few days. It may be only for a few days, but I don't want to lend you the power drill. I'm not going to. But it's for Mark? No. It's true that you do feel anxious if you say no. You do feel guilty. And you do feel awkward and embarrassed because you're doing something different. But that doesn't necessarily last. What you get in the long term is a feeling of being able to choose what you want to do, what you want to say yes to, what you want to say no to, is a feeling also of really being able to care. And I think that's a very important point. How much do we really care for someone if we're doing something when we don't really want to be? I know if I'm on the receiving end of that, I feel awful. I hate to feel that somebody's spending time with me or doing something for me when the only reason they're doing it is because they can't say no to me. It's an awful feeling. This school in North London is one of a small but growing number where AT has become part of the curriculum. It was introduced by teacher Anna Hordyke. I decided that it was really a wonderful idea and then the opportunity arose for the school to have, some, uh, to have a new curriculum and um, I suggested assertion training as a very valuable part of young, training for young women. Let's go back to the role plays that we were doing and we were up to... Soon these girls will be leaving school and will have to face many pressures, some of them to do with boyfriends. Okay, let's see. Um, Nazarene, where are you? Oh, there you are. Right. Would you like to be the girlfriend and Saffron, would you actually like to be the boyfriend? Right. Saffron, sit where Kathleen is. You change places again. And maybe put the chairs together and maybe pretend it's a sofa or whatever. Right? <coughs> so there you are watching telly and you're on your own. Remember, you've only got a couple of hours before your parents come home. Would you get off, will ya? Oh, come on, what, what's the matter with you today? Like, I just don't feel like... Oh, I don't, just don't feel like anything. What's the matter? Listen, listen, Nazarene, look. I'll be going out with you for three months, OK? And nothing's, like, happened. And we have had no, we've had no sex, you know? I mean, a boy I'm can't live like this. With you. Oh, come on, Nessie. Look, your mum and dad is out. Nobody is going to know. Look, I just don't want to have sex with you, all right? I don't care if my mum or dad is out. Oh, come on, Nessie. I know you. You say no, but you really do mean it, don't you, darling? No. When I say no, I mean oh, no. Oh, come on, Nessie. Look, you're not going to get pregnant. Oh, yeah, I'm not going to get pregnant. Most of my friends are pregnant already. We're going to use precautions. Oh, yeah, most, most my friends use precautions, but still got pregnant. I don't want to end up pregnant. Well, what's the matter with you? you scared? I'm going to be gentle with you. I don't care if you're going to be gentle with me. Look, if you really love me, you wouldn't pressurise me, would you? Oh, come on. I mean, look, come on. I, look. No! It feels really good, you know, afterwards. I don't care if I really feel good. I just don't want to have sex with you. But, I mean, you say yes. You say yes one minute. You say no. You say no next year, you say no the year after. How can a boy live this long, live without sex this long? I don't care if a boy can live without sex this long, but I can't. I can't live with it if I get pregnant. And but I don't want to have an abortion, that's for sure. Well, then I might as well say, this relationship is not going to carry on. I mean, I can't see you anymore, Nazarene, because, I mean, you know, I can't live without sex this long. I mean, I've been going with you for, what, three months? 
Well, I, I mean, don't care. You don't care. You don't no, care I about don't me. Care. You don't care I about don't my feelings. I don't care about you. No, you're putting words in my mouth now. Oh yeah, we've heard this one before. Listen, I'm going, okay? And just don't phone me out and don't call me, because if you're not going to give me what I want, that's it. Gary, I'll, I'll let him go. All right, well done. Good. Okay. Um. Right. Saffron, you were putting on all that pressure, okay, all that pressure onto Nazarene to actually have sex with you. How strong did you feel putting on that pressure? Uh, was there at any time that you thought you might win? I thought I might win, like, sort of, like, because I felt strong in, in my personality. But I think she was quite strong. I mean, she was really saying that she didn't really want to have sex with me because she was saying about getting pregnant. It made me a bit scared when she said that, even though I said, oh, we take precautions. I think that's the root of a lot of our difficulty in saying no to people, is that we do care for them. Mm. And I was always brought up to believe that if I cared for somebody, I couldn't say no to them. Because the fear is that if you say no, then the friendship will finish or the, the work relationship will finish. Somehow you've got to keep on saying yes because you don't risk actually saying no to somebody. We asked Saffron how differently people reacted in real life. With my boyfriend, I don't actually find it very difficult to say no because I find quite assertive and strong to say no in the right times. Um, I think I've got a hold on him. I mean, I feel assertive and strong and confident when I speak to him. And when he asks me thing, I say, no, if you really like me, then you respect, respect me. No, it's very kind of you, Mr. Minards, but no thank you. But it's only a dinner. I know. That's why I find it so hard to turn it down. Or turn me down. Oh, it's nothing personal. I do like working with you. But if you don't mind, I'd like to leave it at that. We work well together. Why spoil it? You like to keep your private life private, eh? That's about it. Well, I suppose you have your reasons. I can't say I share them. Shall we carry on with this lock till we're finished? OK. David, this isn't easy, but I have to say no. No? You heard no. I'm not going to lend you the £250. It's against my principles to buy something I haven't got the money up front to pay for. But it's not against mine. <laughs> Well, I'm not going to change my principles to bring them into line with yours, nor would I expect you to for mine. You won't lend money, even to your own son. Especially to my own son. That's why it's so hard to say no. I'm sorry, David. Well, I knew I could rely on you for a bit of old world bullshit. Still, worth a try. No, Mother. I, I feel awful having to say it, but I'm afraid you can't stay that weekend. Oh, why not? Because I've just managed to park all the children and Steve. Oh, so it'll just be the two of us. Oh, lovely. No, Mother. It's just that I need some time to myself before I go stark staring mad. But your own mother. Look, it's not that I don't care about you, because I do. I find it difficult to say this, but I need some time to myself without everybody screaming at me. Yes, but I won't scream at you. I know. Any other time, I'd love you to come. But that weekend, I really need the rest. Very well, dear. I'll go somewhere where I'm wanted. I don't like upsetting you. I'm not upset. Do you understand, then? Yes, I do. I'm disappointed. But I've just thought of someone else I can ask. Thanks for being so nice about it. Tell you what, I'll give you a call after the weekend and we'll fix something up. Very well, dear. Bye. No, 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 really, Laurie, thank you very much. I, uh, I don't like refusing you, and I must admit I'm tempted, but no. Come on, just a quick one. No, 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 I've enjoyed the session, but I think I'll be going now. Just the one! No, thanks all the same, I'll see you Friday. Hmm? Why let painful, sensitive teeth cloud your day when Sensodyne can give you protection. And now there's new Sensodyne F, the toothpaste for sensitive teeth with fluoride and a really fresh, clean taste. With regular daily use, Sensodyne acts progressively to relieve the pain. Use Sensodyne 
and ask your dentist about sensitivity. Sensodyne toothpastes to relieve the pain of sensitive teeth. At the first sign of a cold, take Beecham's powders or Beecham's powders capsules and feel better fast. On the left, claret. On the right, Bordeaux. They look the same, taste the same, because, in fact, they are the same. Only one wine region can call its red wine claret. That's why people who know choose Bordeaux from under three pounds a bottle. Christmas gifts for your handyman from Black & Decker. With our Quattro drill, he can drive into anything almost as if it isn't there at all. Or get him the scroller so he won't have to cut corners. There's a workmate that'll stand by him through thick and thin. There's our cordless screwdriver that screws in and out. Or really surprise him and get him a stripper for Christmas. Tough tools to last this Christmas and many, many more. Few pleasures compare with relaxing in front of a good video. Of course, one needs something as ingenious as the new Hitachi video with transmitter. Everything is remote control. Programming for a start. Next week's movie, simple. Then there's picture in picture. So I can check what's on TV while watching video. Or vice versa. And super indexer. Brilliant. A sort of electronic bookmark that goes straight to the start of each recording on the cassette until it finds the one I want. After all, when I'm as relaxed as this, you wouldn't want me to have to get up. Would you? Total remote control video. Lie back and think of Hitachi. nice to have fun while we're learning but at times that becomes impossible as we look closely at ourselves and perhaps uncover some painful memories in fact this exercise is designed to unblock some of the difficulties we have in saying the word no The two of uh, they call the non-communicators. <laughs> <laughs> what was happening? Not at all. We just couldn't let go at all. So there's something going on there. What did it? I mean, is it, does it just remind you of something? Yeah, not being able to say what you want. <laughs> not being able to. Yes. And the frustration of that. Breathe. It's okay. Let it go. Let it go. Has it reminded you of a particular situation? Or what? Mm. Hmm? Breathe. When you were afraid to say what it was you felt? I was happy most of the time, and I... I mean, you can say, if someone's shoving you, you can turn around and say, stop it, that's easy, because you can be aggressive. Just say it to someone that you don't know. You're trying to think of a situation in your life where you felt like that. It all comes up. It sounds so bloody easy when you say it, but when you're actually doing it, 
Yes, it's because you don't know and because it's it's something designed to get to things. I mean, it is a powerful thing. It can be a very powerful thing to do because it just triggers off memories. Yeah, I didn't like the whole thing when you started off and it's pushing people around and yelling at someone. It's completely against me and how I've kept controlled. I mean, I feel an idiot letting go. I don't like crying. I don't like showing myself up in front of people. Penny's ex experience does show us that it's very difficult if you do store up a lot of resentment, that if you don't say no when you want to for years and years and years, that it builds up a lot of frustration, a lot of anger about the situation. You can feel very angry to the people you didn't say no to at the time. You can feel angry to yourself for having been so weak and not having stood up for yourself better. What it can do in a class is face you with some of the things that you've kept buried for a while. And in the course of finding out about yourself, about old attitudes and old feelings, things can come up which you may find difficult to handle. But you have to remember that this is in the context of a class. So there's a lot of support in the class. There's a lot of, a lot of support from the teacher. And there are also two sessions in the model that I use devoted to feelings and how to handle feelings. It helps us not be so afraid of feelings. And as Penny said, instead of just being on the surface, there are things that go on underneath which do make us behave in ways that we don't want to. <coughs> there are many times when we do not say what it is we feel, and I think this is a block for an awful lot of us at a lot of times, and that it is the intensity with which we feel those things that makes an awful lot of these situations which we want to handle assertively very difficult. You know, some of the things, whether they're long-term things, right? It's past times and we don't actually say what it is. Mm -hmm. We don't express it for all sorts of reasons. I mean, often because we're afraid mm -hmm. to, but, it, but they don't go away. One of the things we think about if I don't say yeah, anything. Yeah, but the trouble is when you do something like this, it brings it all back again. Is that a good thing? You're asking us to go into different situations that we've dealt with badly or well in the past and resurrect it all. And I find that incredibly difficult to do. I don't think it's possible to do it without resurrecting some of it. It's not that the whole thing comes up now. Some things are triggered off now but you don't get more than, than you can handle. It just feels quite frightening at times, but you don't believe mm. me now, but you do get some insight into that, and it just... Well, if you say so, I, I, I can't believe it, because I know it's not very often I feel like this. I, I just can't control how I'm feeling. And then I know what my thought was that triggered me off into this feeling, but that, I don't think that's healthy. I don't think it's good. I don't feel good. Because you haven't got, you're still holding on to it, that's why. And you're angry with me. No, I'm more angry with me. <laughs> Did somebody, I mean, have you been told that you shouldn't lose control? Is this part of a, something you've learned, that you shouldn't express feelings or something oh, like God, that? Oh, God, yes. Yeah. It's a lot of people, it's a Family situation where you don't show how you feel or you keep your counsel. <coughs> At least now, if something does upset me, I do say it. <laughs> but what I don't like about it is that when you say role play, suddenly you start off feeling ridiculous. You start off feeling a real prat because you, you feel like you're at kindergarten and you're trying to psych yourself into a situation that you were in years ago, which you don't want to deal with. You just want to carry on with your life from now, hence. And resurrecting it all is, is terribly unnerving. Mm -hmm. But in learning to do so, I mean, in, in, in deciding to come on this course, there must have been something that you wanted to... I sitting on the floor blabbing my eyes out. <laughs> That. There must have been something you wanted to improve or something, yeah. and, and, and it, I mean, this is, you can't 
say that none of these feelings have any relevance to that. Do you see? That's what I'm yeah. saying. Yes, I Either see. Either we kind of skate along on the top like that. I was expecting more of a skate. Ah. <laughs> I didn't expect to have to go for a bloody great swing. <laughs> It was difficult for me to say no because somehow the class had managed to strip away certain layers of defence which I'd built up regarding a relationship I'd had with my first husband which was pretty violent and I knew that if I said no to him that I would get a violent reaction whether it be verbal or physical. Consequently you build up a defence to, instead of say, no, I don't want to do that, you skate round it. And also, I think, um, com what compounds that is perhaps the relationship in your family, that it's better to not exactly say how you feel, but just to be very, very vague. Some experts question whether learning to be assertive can really help with serious emotional problems. Deirdre Saunders frequently deals with a large number of such problems each week as agony aunt for the son. I think there are some therapists who believe that assertiveness techniques, learning these techniques, is just a way of tinkering with the, the surface rather than dealing with the deep down problems. And it's true that assertiveness is not the answer to every relationship problem that one can ever come across and it's not the answer for everybody. If you really have had a a deeply damaging childhood and you're not managing to communicate clearly with yourself then you do need to go and get more lasting help you need to actually sort out what's going on inside you what are your unmet needs because unless unless you know what your needs are you can't possibly communicate them I certainly felt um, on the occasions that I was upset that I was dealing with something that this could not help me with and after the yes-no session and the, the cushion throwing, where you, you threw the cushion and you threw away um, a feeling about your, yourself, um, I felt that it was time to do something constructive about it because there was obviously something underlying which was more intense than I wanted to think about. It's difficult to put into words. I mean, I'm rambling on because it, it's... It hurts to say it. And I then tried to find somebody who could help me with it. But I don't think um, that really is a part of assertiveness. It shouldn't be a part of assertiveness. But it does give you an inkling into where you need to work at in yourself, which is an asset. Tell me about some of the ways you've noticed that people have changed after attending one of the courses. It's difficult to specify, but it's very, very exciting watching the people I've trained. Also some that I've kept in touch with over the years, mm -hmm. and you can see these change changes having a lot of effect on their lives. Basically, it's the excitement of watching people become less afraid of situations in their lives and becoming more themselves, actually developing more confidence. And because that's what you're helping people to do, it's actually taking hold of themselves, feeling they can do something. Mm -hmm. So it may be taking a course, it may be leaving the job that you've wanted to leave for a long time, it may be starting a job, it may be dressing differently. It's all sorts of, of various ways in which people begin to express themselves with more confidence and more certainty. It's very fascinating to watch because what I'm teaching is nothing new. Much more, I'm saying things that people know already. And there's that glint of confirmation and they think, yes, I did know that, but I wanted somebody else to say it. The main thing I suppose I got from the whole course was the feeling of being able to control my life more, control myself more, my feelings, not necessarily to do away with them, but to feel happier, to fit. I constantly tell people my life fits better, and it does, the way I feel about things the way I express those, the way I work with people. So, for me, I suppose the main thing was the ability to control my own behaviour and being happy with that. I have an opinion. I have the courage to put that forward now. Um, and in my whole life, my personal life as well, this has made a lot of difference. People notice I'm there. I'm glad that they notice I'm there. I'm not trying to hide behind 
myself, really. Um, there was a facade there before. I was too afraid to project my own personality. It's coming through now, and I'm really glad about that. I can feel it, and other people can see it too. People have noticed. I think assertiveness training is a must for everybody. In the next program, we come to another crunch point for people on the course, criticism. A subject that I would find totally irrelevant if people would only see things my way. There are no winners, there are no losers. Somewhere in the middle there's a better way. Sonia, are you deaf or... S S Sonia? Are you deaf or stupid or something? Sorry, Mr. Richards, what have I done now? I distinctly said I wanted this letter on company note paper and this one on private note paper. Oh, silly me. How can I have been so stupid? One of these days I'll get something right. Mm. I'm really giving her a hard time there. Typical of the kind of boss who's quick to get angry and slow to pay compliments. But then... She didn't exactly stand up for her rights, did she? Still, those two are not alone. There are many of us who find it difficult to handle criticism. Politicians expect criticism, and Ken Livingstone has certainly received his fair share. I suppose when I look back at the beginning of the GLC, I mean, the amount of criticism I had to live with, because all the press and a lot of the public thought I was this sort of horrendous monster. Um, and it is very, very wearing. I mean, there were times when I was extremely low and debilitated. But I suppose what got me through was always a, a, a group of people being supportive. Um, I always believed what I was doing was right. At the end of the day, I suppose, my position is that providing you do what you believe is right, it doesn't matter if you're the only person doing it, um, you're in a position where um, you should carry on and do it. It doesn't matter how much sort of walls of hatred and emotion break over your neck when you're doing it. Because if you actually don't do it, and then you spend the rest of your life regretting that what you did was betray something you believed in. That's much more of a problem to live with than the short-term pain of everyone screaming abuse at you. I suppose criticism is a very difficult thing for people to handle, and I often found a I mean, criticism from friends was very difficult to handle. Criticism from enemies was uh, that was just business, you know. It rolled off my back. Um, and it's when those close to you let you down, that's when you've got your problem. Uh, it's those attacks that are really painful and wounding. And, and what about successful business people like Anita Roddick? Are they affected by criticism? If you came into me and said, oh, I think this is a real crummy outfit you've got, I'd, I'd question it. I'd know how to ask you the right questions to find, to find out why you're saying that. But it wouldn't break my heart. But if somebody I respected said that, my heart would break in a million pieces, I think. It's not so much somebody you know, it's somebody that you admire or somebody whose opinions you respect. I, I think because it's, a, it's an erosion of your personality, it's erosion of your character, and when you put so much of your life into something, they're actually saying, oh, that's a bit shitty, and, and they're saying that you're a bit shitty. Um, so I think it comes back to a very personal thing. Why do so many of us react so badly to criticism? I talked to Anne Dixon, teacher and writer on assertiveness training. That's right. It, being able to distinguish between what you do and who you are. That's right. And that is very, very difficult to do in criticism. But that's one of, the, one of the reasons why, is that when we're children, we tend to be criticised in that way. Parents don't usually say, well, you've made a mess and you've behaved in a bad way or you've behaved in an unkind way. It tends to come out as a label, you know, you're unkind, all right? 
you, you, uh, you're selfish, you're clumsy, you're stupid, you're ugly, you're not as good as your brother or, you, see, you know, whatever it is. And the difficulty with that is that you can't respond to that because it's a huge label and it's very difficult, it's a whole b burden, it's very difficult to be able to respond and say, well, no, that's not true. I did make a mess and I, you know, I, I was clumsy, I did break that. But that doesn't mean to say I'm always that. We can't do that as children. And of course, if you do do it as children, you tend to get more criticism or a smack or something else. You don't have the power in that situation. And the other thing is that when we're criticized as children, we tend to be punished in some way. You know, just but somebody turns away or there's no affection or an, a physical punishment or deprivation. So you soon learn that if you're criticized, you're disappointing somebody. You've done something wrong. It's who you are as a person and it makes you not lovable, right? So that means, as adults, we often still respond to criticism from that way. We still respond just as we did as children. Typical reactions can be aggressive or sarcastic. Well, you're not going out in that jumper, are you? <laughs> We're not going anywhere special. Honestly, you look really scruffy. What, me, scruffy? I'm not scruffy. Take that back. You haven't shaved, washed or brushed your hair. Oh, I see. Frightened I might show you up in front of your fancy friends. Anyone with any intelligence doesn't just look at the appearance, you know. Other people can see through to the real person. Just as well you're going out with other people then, isn't it? Because I'm not going out with you looking like that. 4.30, better be off. Golly, is that the time? A tribe will be home in a minute, expecting something to eat. What are you giving them? Oh, something with mince in it, I'd expect. Honestly, Pauline, you are unimaginative. Well, we can't all be Delia Smiths like you, Carla. I didn't mean that nastily. No, of course not. When I was going to give them larks, tongues and aspic, but they're out of season. Criticism can undermine our confidence and self-esteem. Assertiveness training helps to change the way we react. I really feel angry with that comment. It was quite unnecessary and I would like in future you keep your comments to yourself about my person. <laughs> what's your doubt? I think I just felt silly. Because <laughs> I'd scream at him, he's done it so often to me. Well, you're just so. trying to do it differently. Do you I, feel alright in that? No, you I still don't. want to scream it, it, at him. It's, 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 um... Assertive training helps a lot handling criticism. It, it helps you to think before responding completely. One, one of the things we do, because oh, we're often quite we're threatened by criticism, oh, yes. we may uh, respond with a, with a bit of bravado right mm. and appear to let it just roll off our backs but underneath often we're quite hurt but we don't like to show it because we think that's going to make invite more criticism or make us appear more vulnerable so we put on a tough show a tough front or we just sink into being very self-piteous and resigned and feel awful wretched miserable that you're no good at anything you might as well go and put your head in the oven i mean we just take exaggerate the whole thing right yeah. so either way we don't really listen to the criticism. So what assertion helps you to do is listen to what the person says and then decide, is there something useful for me to learn from this? All right? Because we can learn not only in professional situations, but in personal situations. Me, Scruffy? I'm not Scruffy. I think you are. Well, right, maybe I am Scruffy, but I don't see myself as a fashion plate. Nobody's asking you to be, but you might at least make a bit of an effort. Okay. Point taken. Right, let's work on it. I'll have a quick shave. You choose me something to wear. You don't need me for that. All right. I'll choose and you shave. Honestly, Pauline, you're so unimaginative. <laughs> me? Unimaginative? Well, mince again. Well, fair comment. I am unimaginative when it comes to cooking. But I'm not unimaginative in other ways. It's my painting. The things I do with the children, my ideas around the house. You can't really call me that unimaginative. Well, perhaps not. The skill in managing criticism is to handle it, is not to be swamped, is not to be annihilated, is to, as I, as I said earlier, it's to learn to listen and sift out what you can learn from it. And the confidence that grows is, is wonderful because a lot of us spend our lives avoiding criticism. Right, because it feels so devastating, because it's such a minefield, mm. we have to take it slowly and 
the most important thing is actually bringing it out in the open. It's almost as if most of us have this really poor self-image, which is very individual, but a poor self-image inside which we're dragged down by. And so halfway through, this tends to be halfway through the course, participants take this risk, because it, it is a risk. We actually have to look at these areas of ourselves, often which we feel we'd rather not look at. Right? But as long as we don't look at them, they have a lot of power. But when we begin to look at them, there's an enormous relief. So we begin by looking at what we feel are criticisms, what criticisms that we haven't handled in the past, just making lists of them. And then we follow an exercise which helps do two things. The first is diffusing the word itself, because often it's the words, as I said, like the labels. The words are terribly difficult. To, and we all have our own, like, for example, if I'm criticized for being intense or aloof, which are both true, it's taken me quite a long time just to accept those about myself. So it's first being able to handle criticisms that are true and being able to acknowledge them using the word, yes, I am intense, yes, I am aloof, yes, I can be insensitive. It's actually acknowledging without being defensive or being angry or hurt with the other person, just saying, yes, that's true. Aren't you quite manipulative, actually? Yes, I can be. I find it very difficult to deal with people directly. I naturally look to approaching sideways and coming alongside people. You never think before you speak. Yes, I, I know I don't think before I speak sometimes. It's something which I'm aware of and I'm, I'm not happy with. But uh, um, if that bothers you, I'll, I'll try and um, do something about it. But it is something which I, I, I do find very, very difficult. Jana, I do feel that you're terribly unassertive. I accept that it's true. I am unassertive. I find it quite difficult to express my feelings clearly. But I'm a lot better than I used to be, and I'm working on it. The second thing is being able to contradict a criticism when you really don't think it is true. Sometimes we take anything that's around. If somebody criticizes us, even if you know it's not true, Right, you think, well, they did say it, so perhaps they do have a point, perhaps they know me better than I know myself. And often, we, you're just left with that when it's more appropriate to say, that's not true at all, you know, I'm, d I'm not like that. Uh, that's you. But, but why do you think so? Sonia, are you deaf or stupid or something? Neither, Mr. Richards. Not deaf or stupid. What have I done? I distinctly said I wanted this letter on company note paper and this one on private note paper. Well, that's exactly what I thought. But if you listen to the tape, you'll find you've got exactly what you asked for. Oh, really? <clears throat> well, well, why didn't you check it with me? Because you weren't here to check it with. Oh. You obviously look upon me as some kind of a bozo. So what gives you that impression? Uh, well, <laughs> perhaps it was a bit uncalled for, and so I'm, I'm sorry. Do you think we could have those two again, please? Sure. Work and a whole sense of success or failure in life are so often inseparable. So dealing with criticism at work is a particularly sensitive area. All of us at one time or another have been criticized by a boss or have had to criticize people who work for us. It's never easy and can create a bad atmosphere. Many large organizations in recent years have recognized that AT can improve communications at work. Ken and Kate Back are management consultants who specialize in assertiveness training. I think assertiveness will play an increased uh, part in the workplace because I think more and more people are not prepared, for instance, just let aggression pass at work. They feel they have a right to be treated reasonably in the workplace. So I think they will stand up to aggression in the in the future more than perhaps people have done in the past and that means in turn the people who behave aggressively in the workplace will need to develop more assertive skills in handling certain situations because they won't be allowed to get away with it to the same extent as they have in the past. But it's not just aggressive bosses that AT can help with. Here at the Bradford Institute of Management Training Mike Woods teaches how to deal assertively with an angry customer. I appreciate that you may be angry about something, sir, but I think as soon as you tell me what the problem is, there's bound to be... A I problem. shouldn't have to tell you. It's your business. Well, that means... I'm only a customer, for God's sake. Well, perhaps you'd just like to explain the situation. I'm sure I can find an answer for you. Look, it was last Tuesday. I brought something in. Right, so do you know what that item was? Um... Aggressive bosses and those in power uh, can often make us fearful of speaking up. We're talking about being able to communicate 
equally between human beings without control issues, the, the issues of who's in charge and who's not in charge, so that you're able to get real information between two people. We had an example fairly recently of being called in by a senior manager of one of the large engineering companies. And this man is a very, very tough manager. He's, he's a very strong manager, works at a big multinational company. And he found that his aggressive stance with his own managers meant that he, w he was getting yes sir, no sir from his own managers. And he was getting impossible promises. They weren't meeting deadlines because they were frightened of him. So we took them into a quite a long training course where they actually role played being able to be assertive with him so that he was able to get deadlines and actual objectives from his own people. It wasn't until I got into politics and started meeting the people running Britain that I realised I could do as well as they can. So my self-esteem simply comes from a, a recognition of the inadequacy of everybody else. You know, I recognise everybody up there is a Wally, so I didn't feel particularly bad about being one myself. And I think a lot of people get taken in by all the trappings of power and position, and they assume that the chairman of the board is a tremendously intelligent person, but he's surrounded by all the people that are doing the work and buoy him up. Um, his secretary most probably really runs the entire National Westminster Bank, you know, and he just looks decorative and with distinguished grey hair. The reality is, at the end of the day, a lot of the people that look important, impressive and intelligent are as big a dodo as the rest of us. Anita Roddick employs 1,500 people throughout the world. As a highly successful woman, does she find it necessary to be aggressive? I see aggressiveness as a sort of watered-down version of violence. I see it coming from an angle of not, um, no confidence and a little bit cowardly. And no matter what, and it smacks of this bloody 1980s new brutalism where everything that is forceful, either visually or in, in words, is acceptable. And I don't think that's where, certainly where I, I feel I've come from, which is very much the thinking of the 60s, which is a little bit more anarchic. Um, I certainly have had to arrive at the point by being bloody assertive, but that's because you're driven by a passion. It's nothing to do with, um, you know, I'm pushing my way, I'm, I'm treading on people. It's to, to do with having an idea that you passionately believe in and, and in love with, and you push it forward and not being diluted, not being distracted. Um, so being assertive, um, wanting to do what I want, I've always wanted to do, um, that's, that I had to, I mean, I had to live and breathe that. Being aggressive, I, I, I would die. I would die if somebody said I was aggressive. Bob Gowland is the managing director of Phillips Auctioneers in Chester. He recently completed an AT course at Bradford and was so enthusiastic about its advantages that he encouraged the rest of his staff to do a course. What I really got out of the course was um, as a result of using the video camera to go through a difficult situation, uh, either having to um, correct or, or dis discipline a member of staff or, or deal with a belligerent client, something that was, that was difficult. To my horror, I actually saw myself coming over in a difficult situation as being thoroughly aggressive and overbearing, which is not my norm, I don't think, anyway. I mean, it's possible, and this is something of which I am now aware, and may, I hope, in the future be able to do something about, because if, one, if I am off balance uh, in a certain situation, the last thing one wants to come over is, 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 is being thoroughly aggressive. The way employees behave with clients or customers undoubtedly reflects on the company. Using AT can therefore help to improve the company's image, make it more competitive and presumably more profitable. Most people, when they hear, the, hear about assertiveness training, you know, smirk and think it's all quite right, humorous, they don't realise that being assertive, in my view anyway, is being boringly level and in the middle. Not being aggressive or passive, but being absolutely average. And that is very effective. Assertiveness training is the most important part of selling. It's the bit that matters. Uh, and we are probably rather unusual in this company. I like to think we're rather special, but we're really very unusual because every member of staff from top to bottom, or bottom to top, deals with and talks to the public every single day. So every single day they are actually selling Philips. And assertiveness training is actually the important part of that. Some companies can see a very direct link between uh, people becoming more effective and then increased profits, particularly where you're dealing with people who have direct responsibility for sales, for instance. 
But when you're dealing with other sorts of groups of people within an organisation, um, what it's leading to there is a better working relationship amongst people. And people find that they're able to be much more open and honest and direct in their conversations. And so these conversations that people have are much more efficient. You could therefore argue that, again, there's a, an indirect link with profit, but that isn't the reason raison d'etre. The certainly isn't about getting your own way. It's basically about feeling good about what you can get, understanding the situation and balancing it realistically. It certainly isn't about getting your own way. In a real organisation, you have to work for the boss or face the consequences, and I'd agree completely with that. But on the other hand, you don't have to feel bad about it. You don't have to be tramped in the ground over it. And if you do have to be, for a particular time, you have to actually put yourself down, fine. But understand that. The mere fact that you are in charge, that you can initiate things, is extremely liberating. It removes a lot of the frustration. I can remember before I became leader, always being blocked by other leaders uh, and who I thought were unimaginative and stupid and I'd seethe with rage and um, yeah, I mean, all the anger would turn in on myself. And then becoming leader meant that I was in that position where I could unblock all those things. And I found the scale of anger I had, I mean, just basically ebbed away. Things would go wrong, but I wouldn't worry about it because there were other things that were more important to move on to. And I saw my doctor have a regular checkup, and he went into raptures because my blood pressure had declined dramatically and said this was wonderful. And he came to the conclusion what was happening was most probably my adrenaline flow was being suppressed. I mean, simply because I was feeling utilised, I was feeling stretched, and I was being useful um, in my definition of it. Um, I wasn't getting the day-to-day -day frustration I think a lot of people get sweating away at their job and seeing some idiot in the position above them screw up all their good work by their short-sightedness. Not being frustrated by other people obviously lessened Ken Livingstone's frustrations. But most of us are not in charge and have to cope with the possible stress of working for others. Can AT help us to deal better with stress at work? If in fact I have to bottle up my emotions, I have to be passive or I go over the top uh, aggressively, this produces stresses in me because I can't release the, 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 the sort of adrenaline and all the various other factors concerned with me. I can't release them. There's no way I can actually get rid of them. Um, when, in fact, I am put in a stress situation, and uh, in the jungle law, I would either fought, fought or, or run. I still have to face you. I can't run. So therefore, these things go into my own body and start doing things into my own body. Unless I learn to control those things over a period of time, it's going to do me a lot of damage. And that's what we're talking about in terms of stress. I'm not afraid of stress, and I don't train people to avoid stress. But I do train them to actually recognize when the stress becomes dysfunctional, when it becomes no longer useful for people to do it. And that's really what you're looking for. So in the assertive behavior course, we're, looking, we're, we're getting people to identify early symptoms of stress, which means they can actually begin to review why they're under that particular stress situation and begin to do something about it. because the lady loves milk tray. Day 92, and everyone is pulling their weight. What a happy lot we are. Them with their pale and watery memories of home, me with my very own bottle of rich, mature ember cream. I can't watch. Where's Carruthers? Gone out. Oh dear, missed the ember cream. Yes. Thanks, Reggie, old man. Remember the Ember this December. A bit nippy out there. Tower 
Records brings you Stop Making Sense, the ultimate live recording from Talking Heads, featuring Psycho Killer, Once in a Lifetime, Slippery People, Burning Down the House, and Take Me to the River. Stop Making Sense with Talking Heads, available on LP, cassette, and compact disc from Tower Records, Piccadilly Circus, and Kensington High Street. The one stop Christmas shop. Every Christmas, Santa delivers thousands upon thousands of big, bulky presents. This Christmas, give him a break. Give McDonald's gift certificates, available in a book of six for three pounds, or separately for 50 pence each. Now, nobody need be stuck this Christmas. The Owl and the Pussycat! The Owl and the Pussycat! Went to sea in a beautiful big little boat! He took some honey and plenty of money wrapped up in a five pound note. The Owl looked up! To the stars above, and sing to his small guitar, all lovely pussy. When George Orwell wrote The Observer, he called it the enemy of nonsense. Read it this Sunday. You'll find it still is. Criticism is one thing, but what about the real put-downs? Somebody said to Oscar Wilde once, I walked right past your house yesterday. He simply said, thank you so much. And Groucho Marx leaving a party, I've had a wonderful evening, but this wasn't it. All very funny, unless you're on the receiving end. Waiter. Yes, sir. This steak is extremely well done. Thank you, sir. My compliments to the blacksmith. I uh, hear you've been picked for the team on Saturday. Yeah, didn't think I was going to make it. <laughs> Yeah, well, I suppose it helps if your dad's on the selection committee. <laughs> Thank you. Pass me my harpoon. Here comes Wendy. Dressed in another pair of curtains. Sorry I'm so late. Only I've been to the hairdressers. Oh, where are they shut? <laughs> That's lovely material, Wendy. I should have it made up into a dress if I were you. Are you implying I'm a mess of something? <laughs> Not at all, darling. In fact, I was just defending you. Clive was just saying you weren't fit to be seen dead in it. And I said you were. Uh, a put-down, that's a form of criticism, isn't it? It's a kind of criticism, yes, but it's usually more indirect. It's not something that you can grapple with because it often comes in the form of sarcasm. Sometimes it can even be non-verbal, just a pat on the head or being silent or ignoring you can be a put-down. Sometimes it's in a kind of remark, like uh, one woman showing another something she'd bought, saying that a new dress, she was trying it on and saying, do you like the new dress? And the friend said, yes, I'm surprised you got one in your size. <laughs> now that, so it can be nasty, but it's often in little comments like, well, you would think that, of course, wouldn't you? It's a way of dismissing, discounting what you say or what you do. And the difficulty in handling put-downs is that you're not really sure about them. You're just left feeling stung, feeling you know, as if you've been slapped in the face, maybe just feeling uncomfortable. But if you, uh, the worst thing is that when you say, well, what, did you, what do you mean by that? Then often the retort is, well, you know, I was just joking, or you know, there's, there's nothing there, you know, you're imagining things. Um, it's very difficult. It's very difficult to handle. Whereas with the other criticisms, you can actually, you have the word, and you could say whether it's true or untrue. But with a put-down, because it's so slippery, it's very, very difficult to catch. Yeah, um, a couple of years ago, I came back off holiday, and um, I was talking to the gardeners who asked me about my holiday, and I said I was really pleased because the man I'd met had phoned me up and asked me to go out after the holiday, and he just said, oh, I thought you didn't like men, Sue. <laughs> I just went completely to pieces and I giggled and laughed and dashed out the door and thought afterwards, mm, you swine, how do you say that? And that really hurt. I disclosed to someone that I was newly divorced and I was expecting some nice answer. I said, yes, it is a bit of a problem because now, of course, you are rather second-hand. Right. 
I'm saying it in my heart. I haven't said it. Well, I still mentioned it to Leslie. Yeah, I can't see it. Yeah. Oof. And I just ah, there was this too much. It was too much. Oh, it to was. Say anything to. It was. Yeah. It hurt so much because I just told them something which was you know, quite close to my heart. <laughs> the apple pie straight back in the face. Mm. Yeah. I was putting some makeup on in my office, and one of the chaps said, oh, "I shouldn't bother. It's not going to make much improvement." I did. I do always answer very sarcastically and funny, but um, I did answer it. I was in a crowd of people with a friend and it was her parents and this guy was pontificating and he was talking you know he said something about uh, plain girls have lots of fun so I bet you're really popular Leslie <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and did he res didn't respond to either no just took I, wiped I, out yes. it's just a kind of wipe out isn't it you know like you I didn't really yes I mean mm. I, can, I t started to tell you because I tell them to laugh I didn't realise how much it actually had hurt. That's right. I mean, does it, I mean that's one of the defenses. I knew I had to bring those crimp tissues. <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't get away with it. Right. Mm. It hurt. Yes, that's right. I bet it does. The skill, I think, is in challenging the put down. Actually being able to say to the person, look, I'm not sure what you mean by that. Can you be clearer? And what this does is expose it, because it's one of two things. Either when somebody puts you down, it's just a, a clumsy attempt at giving you a genuine criticism, in which case you're giving the person a chance to say what it is rather more clearly, what they were trying to say. And if, on the other hand, it's just a bit of gratuitous nastiness, then you also expose that for what it is. <laughs> That's lovely material, Wendy. I should have it made up into a dress one day. I see. They're getting at me, are they? Well, I can do without this, because I have to admit, it hurts. I didn't know Oxfam was sending us blankets. All right, you two. I know you're only joking. I know I'm not one of the world's best-dressed women, and I don't mind a little mocking. But when you go over the top, it starts hurting. So spare me the gags. Okay? Um... Ah. Uh, can I get you a drink? Handling put-downs assertively needs a lot of practice. Anne Carlyle had been put down by a male colleague at work. Her normal reaction was to be sarcastic and aggressive. Right, looking at Anne's body, I can see she needs to speak to Marion about some weight training. How dare you? I feel very, very angry that you should talk like that. You're very personal and I'd like you not to do it in future. Keep your comments to yourself about my person. Right, no, that's fine. All do how would Anne like to have handled the situation? Well, I would have told him how I found his remarks very hurtful. And I'd like him not to, to make these remarks because that, wasn't, that was just one occasion. He had done this to me on several occasions, made reference to my mouth um, or my body. It was his type of humour which was rude and I'd never come across personal humour like that before. So I really didn't know how to cope with it. People are normally very complimentary about the way I look in my, my life and probably also I've got a thing about my age and I felt this was just another bit of getting older, you know, it's just a vanity, thy name is woman and he just catching on a sore point all the time. Uh, I was just tapped into sarcasm. Eventually there were so many problems for Anne that she decided to change her job. Perhaps if her colleagues had been more complimentary about her work, the story might have been different. Hello, girls. Hello, Marie. Hello, Debbie. Debbie, I'm I feel much happier. I've got much more self-esteem now and much more confidence than I've ever had. Uh, I don't carry burdens on my shoulder that upset me or make me angry. Or I can now sort of relate better to people. I can relate much easier. By simply saying how I feel and being specific about certain things, I, I can just do it more easily now. I wished I'd had that a year ago. Where I am now, they love it. That's really great. Um, I'm giving the girls that I work with self-esteem and confidence because they can see a confidence in me. Compliments and praise are important for our self-esteem, but frequently they're as hard to handle as criticism. Bye. Bye. We tend not to remember to say the positive things, you know. We often buy cards with flowery phrases and all these extraordinary things instead of just saying something very positive. 
to a friend, something appreciative to a colleague. Yeah. It was particularly important at work where people often don't know, you know, that their work is appreciated or that they are valued in any way. We just forget. Usually I think it's because we feel a bit mean about giving positive things because we don't usually receive enough ourselves. So it's almost like a backlog of wanting to be recognized and credited ourselves. But it's terribly important to remember those spontaneous messages of affection and, and friendship. Francis has always found accepting compliments very difficult. It is really lovely. Lovely, Francis. Thank you. Thanks for putting so much effort into it. It's great. Great. <laughs> <laughs> you know there I do. <laughs> but don't worry, we've only had two goes. <laughs> now, breathe. It's just, I know, it's right. It's, just, it's very anxiety provoking, isn't it? It just seems really silly to say to your friends, I find this difficult to say. Why? Because amongst friends, you assume it's not. Uh, you assume you, <laughs> that they, that they you know. Say, Look, I was Anne to saying it was difficult to speak to her son. We all find it difficult to say things to people, however close we are to them. Right? People are people and we find it difficult. All right? Okay. Mm -hmm. right. I'm not saying it's easy. You can have as many goes as you want. All right? So, breathe and do it again. Oh, this is a really delicious yeah. curry. Did you make Lovely. this, Francis? Really nice. You do it all yourself? Yes, I do. Um, I find, it, I find it difficult to accept compliments, but um, thank you. Thank you for enjoying it. Well, you deserve it. It's, it's lovely. It's really, really nice. Really nice. <laughs> <laughs> because we often feel just as embarrassed about giving compliments, we frequently say completely the wrong thing. Wow. Morning, Sandra. Look what a bit of sun's done for him. Suppose we could all look a million dollars if we've been lying around on the beach for two weeks instead of slaving away like everyone else. Now you're Miss High and Mighty, I suppose we're going to have to bow and scrape and mind our P's and Q's. Compliments are supposed to make people feel good, not totally deflated. Congratulations on your promotion, June. You really deserved it. Oh, thank you, Doris. Everyone needs praise and encouragement, especially at work. Very good, Brian, old son. <laughs> had to build the mountains up to get the corners square. Yes, I can see you've had a fiddly job on here. <laughs> Couldn't have done better myself. Lovely job. Here. Yeah. Right there, Brian. Thanks. Okay, well, These South London schoolboys are also doing AT as part of their personal skills training. In this session, they're practicing giving and receiving compliments. Now, how to deal with compliments. You may find it strange, but people tend to deal with compliments with great difficulty. Yeah. They find it difficult to accept a compliment as being A, true, B, you know, I mean, you can get so that you feel embarrassed and so here. Um, Perhaps they could teach us and some managers a thing or two. I'm telling you, you're a good mate. You help me in my work a lot and you've got a really good personality and you make me laugh as well. Well, thanks a lot, Jay. So um, I know you mean it and you're a good mate of me as well. Uh, you well, you try and help people out if you can. That's what I like about you, Robbie. Try and help people out if you can. Well, thank you, Jay, for saying that, and um, you're good for me as well. Well, I like you, Jay, because you're very kind, very helpful. Help people out when you can. When I think that's quite important. And overall, you're a good mate. Thank you, Tony. You you help people out a lot too. You help you help me out quite a few times as well before. Thank you. You're a good mate. Make everyone laugh and happy. And if anyone says anything about you, take it and don't, you know I mean, get angry. Yeah, thanks for saying that about me, Rob, and um, you're, you're a good mate as well, and, you know, as I said, you help people out and all that. It's good better. I think you've grown into one of the most pleasant young men in the fourth year, actually. I think you, your attitude is sincere, you're very genuine, you're willing to, you're always willing to listen to people, providing they put it in a way which doesn't get you back up. Right? Mm -hmm. for anything. And I mean, you really have come good, and I think you're going to be very successful. Thanks a lot, Tone. Um, I know me and you are getting on well, and hope to get on well in the future as well. So. Unexpectedly, the boys decide to turn the tables on their teacher. So I think you're a good teacher. I mean, in the past, if we have quarrels, we settle it, handshakes, and everything just all right afterwards. Now, can you, if anyone says anything bad, you behave good, and like any other teachers, you don't explode or tell them to get out or anything. You speak to them. 
directly. Thank you, Robert. That's the way I think it should be. So, um, I think you're a really good teacher, and um, in the past you've helped me out, and um, I think you're really good. And also, you don't act, you, do, you don't just act towards um, as a teacher towards others, you act as their friend as well. Yeah. So that's why um, I really like it. Yeah. Thank you, Dwayne. Yeah, I've got to agree with Dwayne. Yeah, the way you get on with pupils is really outstanding, I reckon. Like you, like you said, you're not just like a teacher, you're a friend, like you're there if anyone wants to talk to you. Any problems, anything like that. I think you're a really good bloke. Thank you, Tony. Well, you want to know how I feel? I feel I, no, good. I'm, I, mean, <laughs> I feel quite strange in a way because it's, I suppose, like you, it was your idea that I sat here, right? That wasn't planned at all. I wasn't going to do that. And I've not done that with any other class either, I must admit. So I suppose, yeah, I mean, I feel, I feel good, but I feel quite strange, if you know what I mean. Mm. I wish my teacher had said nice things like that about me at school. In the final programme, we'll be looking at those minefields, the family and sex, where being assertive and expressing your feelings is often particularly difficult. <laughs> I'm Bernard Matthews, and I believe this is the juiciest, tenderest turkey you can give your family this Christmas. Golden Norfolk, from Matthews Norfolk Farms. Beautiful. I want a man with a slow head. I want a lover with an easy touch, easy touch. Every Christmas, Santa delivers thousands upon thousands of big, bulky presents. Yeah, yeah, all my whiskers. This Christmas, give him a break. Give McDonald's gift certificates, available in a book of six for three pounds, or separately for 50 pence each. Now, nobody need be stuck this Christmas. This is Channel 4. Now, Andrew Sachs and Dixon and John Cleese round up this short series of programmes, Assert Yourself. There are no winners, there are no losers Somewhere in the middle there's a better way How do you see yourself Learning to be yourself Better assert I want to talk to you about your nan's birthday tea. Oh, how boring. Anyway, I'm not going. You certainly are. What do I want to go to a shrivelly's tea party for? I want, I want. You only ever think of yourself. Really, Wayne, you make me sick sometimes. We don't ask much of you. We've brought you up, given you everything you want. Bikes, computers, we scrimped and scraped and worked our fingers to the bone to give you a good home and a good education. What do we get back from you? Nothing. Now you won't even get up off your fat backside to go to your own grandma's birthday tea. I'll get lost, woman. Leave me alone. Families, isn't that typical? People lose their temper, resentment's all round, nothing gets resolved, and even birthday teas aren't what they ought to be. Although things can go very wrong in families, we all have high hopes of a happier family life. Unfortunately, all too often, instead of being open and confiding, communications break down. Assertiveness training skills can help to open up communication in families, 
I talked to teacher and writer on AT, Anne Dixon. What sort of things can happen in a family when we're not being assertive? We bear grudges and resentments maybe towards brothers or sisters because they've forgotten an important anniversary or an occasion or of the misunderstanding that was never tackled directly and so often results in family feuds. We lack the confidence in ourselves to be firm maybe with our children because we don't want to lose their approval or we're afraid of what will happen when they leave so maybe we hold on to them too much. We withdraw maybe from a partner because we find it too difficult to be clear and open and honest about what we want sexually. We play martyr and we suffer because we can't say no and we feel we can't set limits in terms of the work we do at home and so we just go along with it and just bury the resentment. Yeah, I think I'd like to ask my father to talk to me a bit more. Communicate with me a bit more. Communicating with my sister. I find um, her silences hurtful. I would rather she was open with me as to how she's feeling. I want to be able to tell my parents that their attitude when I talk to them on the phone, when I go and visit them, I'm very hurtful and they make me feel totally unwanted and rejected. Um, I'd like to ask my sister not to leave abusive messages on my answer machine. If you try and tackle something even apparently quite small, there's a likelihood that everything else is going to be brought in and there's going to be a lot of awkwardness and maybe around a lot of ill feeling. So I always discourage people at the beginning from tackling the mother who they want to sort out or their husband who they want to sort out or whatever because you can't do it like that. You can't take a relationship that maybe has gone wrong and treat it all in one go. You have to look specifically at what you can do and also your responsibility in it. Changing the way we communicate with our families probably means changing the habits of a lifetime. It needs a lot of effort and practice, but it is possible if we take the first step. I saw my mother on Tuesday and she gave me a real hard time about... She had a go at me about every aspect of my life and I felt very attacked and well, I felt defensive about whatever she was criticising all the time and pretty demolished. And it kind of ruined the rest of Tuesday and Wednesday and I thought I wanted to do something about it. So I didn't have anybody to role play it with. But I practised a bit on my own before I phoned her. And so I rang her up and I said that I didn't, that I felt hurt and angry by the attack that she made on me and my lifestyle and that I didn't want it to happen again and uh, I knew she'd come back with something and she said well it's, it was my opinion you know it's my opinion I said I don't want to analyze it that was how I felt and um, and then I changed the subject to you know it was all I wanted to say on the matter and I changed the subject to something else but I felt really when I put the phone down I just great joy and thrill, it was such a thrill to, to have actually said something and it made me feel so much better and it was like you saying you don't have to say it at the time but you can leave it a day or even a week later you know and still do something about it. Mm. I was just so proud of myself. Out of the blue his ex-wife contacted the family and I was terribly upset about it because I felt I was rolling back in time to being superfluous about being a crutch and not actually being me again um, and when you said as long as you say how you feel that's the positive part this had happened on the Friday or the Saturday I can't remember so on the Sunday after the class when we went back um, I was talking to him and I said I just want you to know that I was very upset about this telephone call and I explained why. Well, I've never a actually talked to him about my feelings about his ex-wife. And I got it out in the open. And just saying it, I felt as though I'd thrown off all those feelings of the, the storm cloud hanging over you and not being able to say anything. Mm. So that was pretty positive. When I left here last week, I went back home and took my father to a barbecue, which I had been invited to thought it was a bit of a dodgy thing taking him along 
but we had a great time. He got absolutely plastered. We had a great conversation, <laughs> a really good conversation, which gave me a lot of insight. And then on Monday, he, uh, or Tuesday morning, he left and said for the first time he had had a really great holiday with me and we gave each other a really big hug for the first time since I was at least that big. Mm. <clears throat> Don't remember it ever happening and we both went to do it and it felt great and I mm. felt really good about him and everything because I, I know he loves me and I love him too, which is great revelation. Didn't think that would ever happen. All right, I go on an assertiveness training course and I might improve things. But in a relationship, it is two, and if the other person isn't assertive back, it's not going to be helpful enough to improve a situation, is it? It's not a question of the other person being assertive back. All you are saying is what you want and being clear about what you feel. And this can come as quite a revelation to people, even if you've known them for 20, 30, 40 years, because we do not say how we feel. And the, the thing we do wrong is that we assume that other people know how we feel and that therefore they're behaving in a particular way, just sort of deliberately to hurt us or deliberately to slight us. Often they haven't the slightest idea how we feel about something because we've never actually said it was particularly important. We've never really conveyed how much it mattered to us. Can I talk to you a minute, please, Wayne? Yeah, yeah, sure. Well, I'm sorry to interrupt whatever you're watching, but I can't compete with that. I've been dreading asking you this, but we're going to your nan's birthday tea on Saturday, and I'd like you to come too. Oh, do I have to? Oh, it would be nice to go with the family. I quite understand it's not very exciting for you to see her, but it gives her a lot of pleasure to see you. See me? She's as blind as a bat. She won't miss me. Yes, I know, but that's not the point. Well, what is the point? It's important to me. I'd like you to come. Oh, all right, whatever you say. Oh, thanks, love. But it is possible to use a set of skills communicating with your family, or with partners, or with very close friends. And, and it goes along the same lines. Once you're able to ask for things that you want and say how you feel, there's often a very positive spin-off. In fact, I've heard reported from many people in classes, because people in families start, you know, following their example, yeah. and suddenly saying, well, you know, you've got to be clear, and say what they feel and being able to say no. So there's a, there's a positive enough as well. It's been said that if you have something to say and you don't say it, then that counts as a lie. Well, it's curious how many people do just that and bottle up their anger and frustrations as a matter of lifelong habit and then suddenly lose total control at quite the wrong moment and woe betide anyone who's close at hand. I wouldn't mind, except sometimes it's me. Good morning. <laughs> I beg your pardon? Good morning. One moment, please. <laughs> Would you say good morning? See? Si. I see. Well, what are you going to do now? Eh? What you do now? I shall breakfast. Ah, oh, let's see you then. See. Si. Where is door? Door is gone. The door, door was here. Where are um? Good morning, Major. I'm so sorry. I'm afraid the dining room door seems to have disappeared. No! I think that there was a lot of uh, almost everyone English in that character. And, and, and uh, judging from its success abroad, a lot of everyone of every nationality. Because there's a bit of us that when we get overstressed, when we're getting a lot of phone calls to handle and people are not being very sympathetic to us and we have too much to do and deadlines to meet and we get tighter and tighter and our voice gets higher and higher and we begin to feel more and more like a, a neglected baby, you know? That feeling inside us being tight and angry and feeling the world is against us. I think that that's something that almost everybody experiences at some stage or another and I always was amused because it seemed to me the world was divided into two types of people people who knew that they had that in them and were therefore amused at Basil and then p people who denied that they had that bit in them and those were always the people who wanted me to be Basil Forty they didn't want me to be the actor who was playing Basil Forty but wanted me to carry their Basil Fortiness for them you see what I mean and why do you think it's so difficult for many people to express uh, really strong feelings Basically because we're afraid of them. We're afraid of all kinds of feelings. We're afraid, 
when we feel hurt, when we feel tearful, when we feel anxious, when we feel nervous, we're afraid, when we feel angry. We don't understand feelings, we think that they take us over, we hate the idea of being out of control, we learn somehow that feelings are embarrassing, antisocial, we learn that it's just not good, it's not on to express feelings openly. Many of us will do almost anything to avoid a confrontation. Hello! Delia! Are you in? You always seem to be doing something in that fridge when I call. Hello, Beryl. Ah, uh, good. Coffee time. You know, you've no idea how much I look forward to our little chinwags in the morning. They really set me up for the rest of the day. There's really no point in talking to Eric. He's in such a state these days over his promotion. I've told him to relax in the evenings and do his DIY. There's a jacuzzi, for example. What a waste of time that is. I think you can get just the same effect by having the taps on full and using the shower attachment. Don't you agree? Oh, I forgot to tell you. I bought a new blouse, Baracus Blue, with a mandarin collar pure. Well, bang goes my study time for the day. Wish she wouldn't do this. Just when I'm settling down to do something constructive. Am I keeping you from something? No. No, not at all. Anyway, where could I get a goldfish at that time on a Friday? Because angry feelings are so difficult to deal with, they're frequently suppressed. I find it extremely difficult to express anger. And I, I do turn it inward, inwardly an, an awful lot, and um, I find it very destructive, in fact. What I do a lot of is swallow my anger, either through drinking or eating. I, I now actually realise that that's what I do most of the day, actually. Yeah. Somehow feeling angry is not permissible and we tend to associate anger with being violent unfortunately so in an effort to control a lot of people for example are afraid that if they were to be angry then everything would come out and they'd destroy someone else or they'd hurt someone else and, and it's true I mean there, it, we are more familiar with an aggressive expression of anger. I left a large pile of manure just inside the front gate. Please, Beryl, can't you see? I'm busy. But well, you're not doing anything. Well, how can I with you around? Honestly, every day I just get settled to do something constructive and you come barging in here uninvited thought... whenever it suits you without so much as even knocking. But I thought you enjoyed my Oh, you're not wrong. Pardon me for living, I'm sure. Oh, but no, it's all right. I know what I want wanted. The next time you're hanging your washing out, I'll get Eric to light the bonfire. Beryl, and I for borrowing mean... my car and putting up your relations for your christenings and whatnot. Well, you can whistle for it. The trouble with bottling up anger is that it can then explode. Leslie had sent a colleague some anti-sexist teaching material, which he dismissed as over the top. At the time, Leslie lost her temper and became very angry and aggressive. She would have liked to have handled it assertively. You know, my whole body language, if I got a hold of his throat, I would have. You know, this is, my, this is quite my problem. You know? <laughs> Your face, yeah. What do you think? What are you seeing in Anne's face? I'm surrounded by men like this, so I can say anything. I find it very difficult. It's chauvinism to think that you are stupid women, that anything you have constructive or intelligent to offer, they feel threatened by that, do they not? So they have to insult you. Take a breath. Take a breath. Is it the overwhelming nature of the whole thing? Uh, it's, yes, it is that it's overwhelming. It is also that it's a very easy emotion to tap into. It's the fact that it's the emotion that you're not supposed to give into. I suppose that's the complexity behind it. That's, mm -hmm. For me, it's the emotion that's always been given the message that it's the one you're not supposed to give in to if you're really ladylike and feminine and... Pleasing. Yeah, you don't give in to anger. You don't express anger. So it's the one I have the most difficulty with because it's the one that's the closest to the service and the one that gets the most disapproval from mm -hmm. others. Mm -hmm. And... I suppose that's it, it's when you express your anger, it's the one you get the disapproval from. And the looks of horror <laughs> and the, uh, the adverse reaction to it. So I suppose... Shock. Yes. 
try and I've, I've sometimes frightened myself because it, it makes you feel more angry. So you generate within yourself and you burn within yourself. I'm getting a tissue. Good, I'm getting a tissue. Francis is finding it. There we are. Thank Thanks. You. So, when we talk of tears, and this is what, this is what get you know, it becomes you very, very easily. First of all, I objected to his comment, but secondly, I also objected to him making such gross assumptions that I was, I'm there to champion the whole of the court, that I'm still not a person, I am the whole of the feminist issue, you mm. know, issue. You're doing it, you're you the know? campaigner. Yes. You know, All right, so, so well, see, this is the, this is the mm. great thing about role play. She sent me some material, you know, about um, anti-sexist, it was an anti-sexist journal. It's completely over the top. I find your comment objectionable. If you want to discuss the subject with me some other time, you can make an appointment. I'll come and see you. But this moment, I'm here to enjoy my drink with these two people. And if you don't want to join in the conversation, I suggest you leave the table. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yes, but you feel... I still felt that I was gunning, you know? Because yeah. if this guy had said why, I'd have said, fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> it's an enormous relief just to be able to say, I feel very angry. You don't have to say it with a little smile. In fact, it's much better if you don't say it with a smile on your face. But you can be quite loud, I feel very angry. But just to say that is an enormous relief. She looks nice in pink. That's his rise. Beryl? Yes? I, oh, I forgot to say. Hang on a minute. I've got something I've been wanting to say to you. It's hard to say to a friend. I see. Well, you know I've got all these papers to mark and a deadline to meet. I get resentful when you just drop in and I can't get on with it. I didn't realise. You never said. I know I should have done. Sorry. I didn't know what to say. I, I didn't want to upset you. Perhaps I shouldn't come at all. You're a very good friend to me and neighbour. It's just that sometimes it's not convenient and sometimes I'm going to have to say so. Shall I go now? Oh, come on. Finish your coffee and we'll start afresh. You wouldn't believe that anyone could mistake America for the East Indies. Yet Columbus did. It's hardly credible that someone could buy London Bridge thinking it was Tower Bridge. Still, that's how the story goes. But could anyone mistake the identity of Special Brew? Well, that's probably stretching things a little too far. Isn't there an easier route to healthy teeth and gums? The Braun Rechargeable Toothbrush. Its brushing action cleans your teeth the way dentists advise. And your teeth look as good as they feel. Braun. Effective brushing made simple. Roll the camera. Shake energy. Special guest, the new rechargeable Philly Shave with double action and charge level indicator. Philly Shave, the perfect performer. Sign on the dotted line for a Scottish amicable pension and who knows where it'll take you. Villa in Spain, we adore you. We waited 20 years for you. Where could a Scottish amicable pension take you? Just ask any independent financial advisor or ring 01 200 0200 for a pensions pack. Three across. Right. Sounds like beetle. Five letters. Hello, darling. Jingo. Lingo. Bingo. Oh.
Oh, this is not normal, Pickle. Oh, Heinz Plowman's Bill. Mmm. It was tangy. Chunky. Why don't we always have this? We do. You live next door, Mr. Johnson. Get into a real pickle. Taste Heinz Plowman's Pickle. Assertiveness training is helping people to deal with their own personal anger. But what about the anger felt by those in minorities or in difficult social circumstances? Mick has been homeless and unemployed for over two years. And for some of that time, he's been on an assertiveness course organized by his social worker. Assertive training is a way of boosting one's confidence. And being homeless, you've got no confidence. You've got nothing. I used to go to the DHSS when me gyro didn't arrive. <laughs> I used to go in, walk up to the counter, ring the bell. When no one come, kept me finger on the bell. Never had no time for anybody. And when I didn't get what I want, when they turn around and say, oh, it's in the post, I used to storm out slam all the doors, <laughs> just be a right raving lunatic. Now I've learned to be more calm with them. If I get uptight, that gets them uptight. So obviously it has the effect of calming them so that they don't get uptight and they're liable to turn around and say, right, we don't want nothing more to do with you. But through assertiveness, I don't get uptight. It means that they don't get uptight and it can all be sorted out calmly. The realization that by changing one's own behavior can affect the behavior of others has helped a group of disabled women in North London to deal with the anger that they frequently feel because of other people's attitudes. Pauline attended an assertiveness course specially structured for the disabled. I used to get very angry in myself um, because I didn't like the way that when I go out in the street, some people can be very nasty and hurtful. And, and it used to upset me quite badly. Where now, me having this assertion call that I just had here, um, I don't get so upset anymore. And I used to kind of, I meant to speak to people, but I used to get very angry and shout. And I used to feel that I would lose a lot of friends. Some of the things we said about, we, we, we talked about, especially about ourselves, were quite surprising because we didn't, you know, this kind of thing when you're talking and when you have to bring it out in the open, um, it can be quite a shock, you know, when you've got a, when you realise why you, why you were so aggressive, so bad tempered and so aggressive in yourself. But now I know why and I now I know how to control it. And whilst on an AT course, Ramona tapped into a great deal of unresolved anger, much of which was to do with her early experiences at school. I remembered my third day at school, where I'd put my hand up to answer a question. And the students had never seen a black child before me, anyway. And as I put my hand up, they turned to see, and they said, her hands are white, her hands are white. And they all jumped on top of me. And the teacher pulled them off. And it was while crying outside the song that I suddenly realised that the teacher hadn't actually dealt with me. Hadn't asked me if I was all right. Just pulled them off and said, how dare you jump on top of her, sit down, and carried on talking to us. And I, I suddenly realised again that I hadn't even told my parents about it. And this all came back to me and that also I'd remembered it maybe once or twice before, but never with the feelings. Never with the, the trauma of that child 
so like it dug it all up. I feel there's so much pressure in the black community and so much anger and not a chance, not feeling that you're in control of anything. And I'm not saying it's a magic wand, but I just feel so much lighter. I know I, know I go in and I fight better. I fight clearer. Um, people take more notice of what I say because I'm calm, clear. I might not feel calm inside, but I can, through assertion training, I can speak calmer, clearer, come to the point about what it is that's wrong, what it is I want, how I feel, how that's made me feel. Um, and it's just different. It's different. It starts things moving in a different way. Everybody in this country is frightened of anger and of being accused of being angry. And as Robin has pointed out in the book, there are some times when anger is necessary. Um, for example, if you come into your house and find a stranger sitting in there, you may have to get angry in order to get rid of him. So that anger can be a very useful emotion. Um, it's much best if you've got it under control. So being angry in a controlled way is quite separate and different from losing your temper, which basically means is losing control. Um, and anger itself, seems to me, tends to come from frustration. That if you want to get to a point and there's an obstacle, then you will get angry, even if it's just the fact that a piece of machinery doesn't work. Just you vicious bastard! Come on! Oh, my God! I'll count to three! One, two, three, right! <laughs> you tried it on this wife too often! Right! Well, don't say I have warned you! I've laid it on the line to you time and time again! Sometimes you've had some kind of uh, disaster in a family which makes them frightened of anger. Um, sometimes a, a family will be frightened of sexuality because there's been some marital breakup or promiscuity or something which has threatened the children. So. And when a family is frightened of an emotion, then it's dealt with often by denying it and sort of putting it under the carpet. And there's a kind of unspoken agreement between everyone that you, you steer clear of that subject. And if you come near it, then you get little warning signals uh, um, <coughs> uh, indicating to you if, you if you're a member of the family, though you won't see it if you're not in it, you won't recognize it otherwise, that if you go any further in that direction, you know, there's going to be a bit of trouble. When I hear uh, of a situation when, for example, parents don't tell their children, maybe the parents are going to get divorced and they don't tell their children uh, because they feel maybe guilty about it and also they want to protect, they say they, don't, they want to protect their children and it makes it so much worse, whereas if they were able to be clear and communicate appropriately with the children about what was happening and then to allow their children to express the anger, the hurt, whatever it was, but to be there for them. It would just save so much damage that I think is done because then we just perpetuate the cycle. We stop children really being clear and expressing their feelings and of course they grow up to be parents and the whole thing is continually repeated. If we approach anger with caution, it is often because we are afraid of the consequences. Asserting ourselves in our sexual relationships is a similar sort of minefield and where we are perhaps most vulnerable and where our self-esteem is most at risk. I've maintained this desperate attraction for years without saying a thing and if I do say it, it all goes wrong. You're setting yourself up a bit. Yeah, yeah. And it's really, it's like they become the most important thing in the whole world. I have to change my whole self. Well, if you love yourself more, it'll tend to that. Yeah, that's helping a bit. That's helping a bit because since last week, I mean, I've been a bit depressed during the week, but I thought, no, that's okay, you know. The more you Still. love yourself, the higher your, the value you put on yourself. Mm, well, I don't think I've been putting any value on me at all. Being assertive about our sexual needs isn't easy. Now I've been married for 22 years, and have only been able to really talk openly about sex with my husband for, say, four years, because I was always embarrassed, you know, about talking about sex or for, about asking for what I want, or as you say, give me more of whatever. Mm -hmm. I just didn't have the guts to do it, you know, mm -hmm. and um, have since overcome that. 
someone laid down little hints to other people that we were having a relationship when we weren't. And um, it was the chap that I was working with. And I eventually ended up having one with him, and I didn't want to. And I felt really so angry about it. I mean, I, I haven't, still haven't come to terms with it, because I feel so <laughs> annoyed that I let myself get into that situation. I didn't want to, but it, I'm to blame. It was me that, <laughs> so two of us there. <laughs> I, no, I just was so annoyed about it, annoyed at myself, because um, I was pre-warned and it was, the rules were sort of set out, and I followed it bit by bit, one, two, three, four, five, here we go, right. I'm getting annoyed. This sounds absolutely daft, I know. I ended up going for a walk with somebody after a disco, and, uh, you know, and being grabbed behind the bushes, which is something that doesn't, I know, it's stupid, isn't it? You know. I, you handle everything and anything because, and, that, and my friends called me naive because I just didn't assume that was what you know. I wasn't given. I thought I was not giving out those messages. Um, I was with a crowd of people who are close and friendly and not operating on sexual levels. What would you like to have done, other than kicking him in the shins? <laughs> <laughs> Only the shins. Well, I know. Um, where, what, could you have done something at an earlier point? I think... I think there, there, there was an actual earlier cut-off point, totally, when I should have said, you know, um, yes, I realise that you must be hot and sticky, why don't you go for a walk on your own? Yes, you know. If you feel put down sexually, that's going to be a reflection of how you feel in your life. Mm -hmm. And whoever you're with, whether it's a friend, a partner, or whoever, is going to respond the same way. Mm -hmm. One of the difficulties in a relationship is that you can have a couple who are very easy maybe in talking about all sorts of other intimate things in their lives, but when it comes to sex, then silence is golden. It's terribly difficult for people to talk openly and clearly about sexual difficulty, sexual requests. And one of the reasons for this is that there's this myth around that, that uh, you really shouldn't be having problems or any difficulties. Everything should be just automatic and natural and wonderful. And if you're having to talk about it, then something's wrong. Oh, I'm so tired. All I want to do is crash out. But the minute I put this book down, I know what'll happen. Sure, I'm knackered. All I want to do now is put this bloody book down and crash out. But the minute I do, I know what'll happen. sex. That's all she ever thinks about. Unless, of course, I'm feeling horny. Then it's the headaches. He doesn't seem to realise that there's anything between the polite goodnight peck and the full wham, bam, thank you, ma'am. God, I don't think I could face all that just now. But I wouldn't say no to just snuddling up like we used to do in the old days. Well, I suppose I won't get any sleep until I've delivered. Oh, no. What did I say? Here it comes. Not again. We did it last night. Well, I suppose I won't get any peace now until I've delivered. So, here goes. The assertive skills are just as relevant in sexual situations there as they are in any other situation. Being able to ask for what you want clearly rather than shifting your body into one position or sighing or grunting. I mean, there are a lot of disadvantages to sighing because it's very difficult to know exactly whether it means more or less. <laughs> um, uh, what are all sorts of being able to say no when your partner wants sex and you don't want sex. Being able to say no, being able to suggest alternatives being able to just to talk about the subject openly, especially if the relationship's gone on for a long time, is very tricky and it does require quite a lot of skill. This is nice. Hmm? Nice. Like this. Yes, yeah, very nice. There's something I want to talk to you about, Bob. What is there to talk about? A lot. Believe me, 
I've had to pluck up courage to even broach the subject. What's on your mind? Well, I know you don't like me telling you what to do, but... You don't give me any cuddles in bed like you used to. I really miss them. <laughs> How can you say that after last night? What do you call that? A lemon meringue pie? That's not what I mean. I really hate coming to bed with you some nights, Bob. Because I don't feel like sex. I feel I have to do it for you. But you never say. It's hard to say you just want to be cuddled. <laughs> What's funny? Well, because some nights I feel exactly the same way, but I can't bring myself to say so either. Expressing our emotions, needs and opinions appropriately is at the heart of assertiveness training. It doesn't mean you get what you want, but it does guarantee better communication. In this series, we've learned that being assertive is important not only in our close relationships, but in all aspects of our lives. But changing oneself is never easy. For me, anyway, that it's a long time of building up this character, this, this persona that everybody else sees. And to start dismantling that and, and reconstructing it is a little scary. It's taught me to like myself a lot more and not be... not to keep putting myself down or blaming myself, um, which feels very good. And I've got to concentrate on realising that it's not a fault to show how you feel or to say it. And to deal with things when they happen, not to let it build up over days or months or years, but deal with it when it happens. So you're only dealing with one little isolated problem, not the whole mountain. Acknowledging feelings and being very specific about what it is I want. Uh, rather than just either being angry or defensive or something. Um, thinking about being specific makes me think that before I must have assumed that other people were mind readers. I, I find that I'm a very timid person. And although I know um, if someone's doing something wrong, and I know it's wrong, I wasn't the person that would come forward and say, well, that is wrong and I disagree with it. Now I can say that and quite boldly. And you are risking a lot, like risking losing your friends, risking um, doing things differently at work as well. And um, you know, this whole approval system is quite difficult to kind of, um, if you've got approval by behaving indirectly, if you start behaving directly, then you risk losing what you think is is approval and it's uh, it's difficult i'm not saying it's easy at all i think previously what i've done the emotions all been jumbling around confusing my intellect and whereas wh where i am able to recognize the feelings that the intellect can then go on and handle the situation yeah. in in what is hopefully a reasonably assertive way the right to decline responsibility for other people's problems the ability to establish my own baseline to clarify to myself what it is I want out of a situation or why I'm going into a situation or what I need from the situation. I'm so used to holding in these feelings and feeling fearful or insecure and perhaps even um, refusing to acknowledge it or why or anything. Just uh, first of all to recognize those feelings, find out what they are, why, why they are and then do something about it verbally. And I, it, it used to seem like mission impossible, and I realize it isn't. There are no winners, there are no losers. Somewhere in the middle there's a better way. How do you see yourself learning to be?
If you're interested in self-assertion, you could send for a copy of our free booklet. A stamped addressed envelope to Assert Yourself, P.O. Box 4000, London W36XJ, Glasgow G12 9JQ or Belfast BT2 7FE, and it's yours. Self-assertion comes to court next on four in the top team event of the tennis year, the Davis Cup final. Simon Reid and David Lloyd report from Gothenburg on today's play in the men's singles. And that's next. Each Tissot rock watch is carved from granite. Each is as individual as your signature. The Tissot rock watch. You're free to curl at home, girls. You're free to wave away. Braun Conley does it all in minutes, the independent way. Braun independent, any, any, any time, anywhere. Braun Conley styles it there. Anywhere, anyway. The best of both girls. All day, Braun independent. Anytime, anywhere, anyway. You can dance Madonna's new album, including the new remixes with Get Into The Groove, Spotlight, and Where's The Party. Right here on Madonna's Album of the Year, you can dance on record tape and CD, a great value gift at Woolworths now. Is he here yet? I wonder if he's changed. Cool. sure of the effect. Polaroid image system. in the night of the generals. I asked you who was more important, a general or a corporal, and you answered general, and of course, I agreed with you. But when the general should be hanged for a filthy, bloody murder... Then the corporal must hang in his place. Sandy, please try to do as I say and not as I do. Remember, you are a child, Sandy, and far from your prime. Maggie Smith is in her prime as Miss Jean Brodie. <laughs> And on Christmas Day, Sean Connery stars in the adventure movie, Five Days, One Summer. Films for Christmas on four. Christmas, Christmas on, on four. four! Yes, of course, Christmas on four! This is Channel 4, where it's time for the first of the weekend's visits to Gothenburg for the Davis Cup Final. One of the most remarkable stories in the whole of sport began 12 years ago with a tall, wiry teenager from Sodatelia. Bjorn Borg, a 19-year-old in the Davis Cup final, won both his singles and the doubles against Czechoslovakia to give Sweden their first ever victory in this, the World Championship of Tennis. This triumph and Borg's five Wimbledon titles that followed sparked a flame that became a forest fire. A generation of clay court topspin specialists began to take over the world. 
Nine years later here in Gothenburg, Henrik Sundström beat John McEnroe in straight sets. Belanda beat a disgruntled Jimmy Connors. And when two more upstarts, Stefan Edberg and Anders Jarid, beat McEnroe and Peter Fleming in the doubles, Sweden had their second triumph and had turned the tennis hierarchy upside down. Twelve months later, they went into the lion's den of Munich, and although they couldn't tame young Boris, their team concept prevailed. Victory number three. Hello, welcome to the Scandinavium in Gothenburg, where the Swedes are through to their fifth successive Davis Cup final. Their opponents this year are India. And this week, really a fitting tribute to the magnificent commitment the Swedes make to the sport of tennis. The Scandinavium here holds 12,500 people for tennis. Tickets went on sale a couple of months ago, and they were sold out in a couple of days. So the Swedes will have patriotic support, that's for sure, and they've made every effort as well to make sure things go well on court. It's down here on the court. We can see the surface the Swedes have had prepared for them. It's taken two weeks to prepare this clay court surface. And it's in fact, it's the very same surface that the Swedish team beat the Americans in 1984. So I think we can expect to see the Swedes playing their defensive game, but the Indians trying to take away the net position. The court, as I said before, is medium pace, but the tennis balls they're using are very quick. So I think we can expect to see a defense against attack game. So let's see how the two teams got to the final. Sweden's path to their fifth successive final took them first to Prato, where they were given a surprisingly tough fight by Italy, and then to Freus, where the French eventually succumbed to Villander and Kent Carlsen. In the semi-final in Barcelona, a shock defeat in the doubles meant the match went to a third stormy day. After ten inches of rain in five hours, Stefan Edberg overcame the intimidating atmosphere and Emilio Sanchez. Sweden were through to the final, and at last, a home tie. India, on the other hand, savoured the grass in New Delhi, where first they had to go to the final rubber against Argentina. They hadn't had any sporting contacts with their second round opponents, Israel. They looked certain to forfeit the match, but a personal plea from Vijay Amrachaj to the Indian Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi, and the match went ahead and ended in a whitewash. Even without the injured Pat Cash, Australia were regarded as a certainty in the semi-final in Sydney, but after Ramesh Krishnan had beaten John Fitzgerald in four sets, Vijay Amrachaj pulled off one of the greatest coups of his career against Wally Masur. Cash's presence in the doubles and Fitzgerald's dismantling of Vijay Amrachaj made it 2-2 going into the final day. But this time the unfortunate Masur found Krishnan in inspired form. India were through to their third final. And this is how the two teams line up over the next three days. Tonight, it's Mats Valander in the opening singles against Ramesh Krishnan. And then, Anders Yarid, chosen in preference to the world's number two, Stefan Edberg, takes on India's captain, one of the great characters of tennis, Vijay Amrachaj. In tomorrow's doubles, the number one team in the world, Stefan Edberg and Anders Yarid, take on Vijay and his brother Anand. And then, in the reverse singles, it's Anders Yarid against Ramesh Krishnan, followed by Mats Villander against Vijay Amrachaj. And there's Mats Villander opening up for Sweden. Amazing, he's still only 23 years old. Finalist this year in the French, the US Open and the Masters. And world's number three. It's on clay courts. I think he's probably the world's number two. He, uh, the only player that can beat him is Lendl. His ground shots are quite superb. And he's actually added uh, a serve and volley to his game. So on clay courts, he's going to be very, very tough to beat. And up against him is Ramesh Krishnan from India. Coming from a famous family, his father, Ramanathan Krishnan, reached the semi-final of Wimbledon back in the 60s. And 87, quarter-finalist in the US Open, beaten by Stefan Edberg. Lovely touch player. Yes, it's a pity the court isn't a wee bit quicker because Ramesh can really play some superb uh, shots. He normally wins when he, he can hit from the other person. In other words, he's a counter hitter. And I don't think today against the land who's not going to give him the pace, it's going to be very difficult for Ramesh to play his best tennis. But who knows? He beat Masur on grass court, so you can't write him off. The officials for the Davis Cup, all Italian, the umpire for the opening match, Sergio Massetti. 
Velanda broke Krishnan in the very opening game. The rallies had little pattern, but the next four games all went with serve. We pick up play with Velanda about to serve, 3-2 up. You see the lines when they're signaling, he didn't see the ball. When you don't see the ball as lines, you put your hands up in front of your eyes, which signals that he was unsighted. And now the referee can make a change of decision. You see it again, a very wide serve. Very close to the line, but uh, Christian obviously shielding the ball. The referees come off the chair to look at the mark. Here's Sergio Massetti, the... Palms down off. signal means it's good. I don't think there'll be any problem with discipline with these two nations, do you? Two of the most sporting nations in the world. Different from last time we were here when the Americans were Sweden's opponents. This is some good language in that match, wasn't there? Sure was. And some great tennis too. It really was a superb match that. And a match really that marked the end of America's <laughs> domination of world tennis. Oh, great play from Christian there. He glided to the net. And there's the Indian bench there. Very pleased with that point. We see it again. A lovely backhand approach from Krishnan. Gets very tight to the net. Makes that backhand volley look easy. Oh, identical. There we go with the palms up on the eyes. Looked good to me. That looked good. It's an action replay, I think. Mind you, very tough. He was unsighted both times. It was a very tough decision to make. Now Vijay's coming on the court as well to look at the mark. Amazing. And his signal's good again. Looks all right to me, although Vijay doesn't look that happy with it. No, now Bats, Mats is coming up. This is quite unlike tournament tennis, Davis Cup, you have a captain, you have a referee, and the balls can be changed. Well, he's having a good laugh about it anyway, Simon. He's certainly getting into the match, <laughs> isn't he? And he's been uh, making personal appearances wherever he's been in the last few days. Great ambassador, great character, and he's lively the place up. So the ball called good, 30-15. Oh. Yes, this is a very important game for Christian. If you could just break back here. But Valanda's played it very well again, those two lovely wide serves, and again, an excellent serve there, the 30-15 wow. point. The umpire telling the line judge to go wider. That's his best shot, that backhand approach. He takes it very, very early indeed. Gets all the pace from Valanda's shot. Get very early that slice back in. Oh, that oh. error. Yes, just when he looked like he was constructing. A creditable point. Not what he needed. But Ander goes two games in front again. Swimming is by four games for two.
We're going just around half an hour so far. Quiet, please. Thank you. Christian seems to have adopted for going for the lines as much as he can so far without much success there by VJ on the sidelines good point good serve and volley point much deeper serve it's glided to the net beautiful backhand volley it does make the game look easy sometimes Forcing the lander back, moving with economy and balance to the net and pushing away the volley, no problem at all. Never seems rushed. <laughs> 